adjourn to um, closed meeting and uh, we are back now and we'll have our regular meeting starting now. Pledge of Allegiance. Michael. Please stand, hand over heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, but liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Director Malloy? Here. Director Mishler? Here. Director Dixon? Here. Director Magner? Here. Chairman Kelly? Aye. Here. Uh, amendments to the agenda? No. I'll make a motion to accept the agenda. Second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Dixon? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Mishler? Aye. Chairman Kelly? Aye. Presentations. Good evening, Chairman Kelly and members of the board. So tonight I'm going to give you a presentation and an update for the Foundation for Pleasant Valley Recreation and Parks. So first off, I just want to kind of give you an update of all of the different things that we've done throughout the year. Um, we had a handful of restaurant fundraisers. We were at Pizza Rev, Cronies, Presto Pasta. Um, Pizza Man Dan's did a, just a straight donation, just a cash donation. And then we did the food trucks in the um, park on the Friday nights along with movies in the park. All of those different events adding up to about $4,500. We had all of these different trucks that partnered with us for those events with the movies in the park. Um, you can see all of the different trucks that were there with us. Also the live music that we had with Rock City Studios. Really great partnerships with all of these different um, businesses throughout the county. And a lot of fun with the food trucks out there. Um, it's a great month throughout July and into the beginning of August. Our fifth annual party for the parks, again, was just a wonderful night. We enjoyed a lot of fun with live music. Um, Caught Red Handed came back again this year. Their music is fantastic. It was hosted again at Camero Grove Nature Center. We had 105 tickets sold this year. Our platinum sponsorship of Camero Hotel and Tourism Association at $5,000, um, which makes it um, wonderful for us to be able to have that, that sponsorship by them. Um, just a few snapshots throughout the night. Uh, it was just a beautiful setting up there with the great barbecue dinner that we have. Um, just a really beautiful atmosphere up there. All of the different sponsorships, the donors, cronies, um, Sports Grill, Nothing Bunt Cakes, Institution Ale, Opalo Winery, The Coffee Bean, The Waters Family, and Al Shire and Widener. Um, those were all 100% donations of um, either food products or um, a cash written donation to us. Um, we had in-kind sponsorships from Can Lamb Farms as well as Red Door Events, which was really wonderful, as well as our table sponsors, which is always wonderful to have those. Our silent auction donors this year, we had a wonderful amount of variety. Um, I basket up a bunch of these. I would sit here and read them all off to you, but it will take me a while. Um, we had a lot of golf this year, which was really neat. So it was really nice to have that theme with a lot of it. Um, a couple of the highlights this year, which I really had been trying to get over the last couple of years was the Canyon Club. They had um, just over a $600 donation with tickets to a couple different um, organiza or a couple different concerts that they had there, which was really nice to have. Um, but we have our, our normals that come back to us every year. It's just a lot of fun um, looking around the stuff that we get donated. Our gross revenue this year was 34,000 or just above 34,000. Again, a wonderful event, and we really appreciate everybody who comes out to that event and sponsors and buys tickets and, and uh, writes checks that night and puts up with me uh, pounding them to buy things uh, and spend money in the evening. A um, couple more events to bring in the year. We have um, Painting with a Twist this year, November 14th. 
Um, most important thing to, for people to know when you're signing up for this is you have to be 21 years old to attend because they are registered as a bar because there is alcohol served there. Um, it's $37 a person to come and 50% of every ticket sold comes back to us. And um, we'll be painting uh, another awesome picture this year. The last two years we've sold out all 40 seats and we have a great evening. So again, we have a couple spots left this year. Um, so get yourself signed up. It's a fun, fun night that we have there at uh, Painting with a Twist in Camarillo on Ventura Boulevard. And then again, our, this will be our second year doing our fifth, um, our 5K, Ugly Sweater 5K and Donut Dash. And it's on the same day as our Christmas parade. And uh, you can be the normal person and just run walk the regular 5K. Or if you want to challenge yourself to run halfway and eat a donut from Rolling Pin Donuts and then finish the race off and come on back, you can do the, the Donut Dash 5K. It's a lot of fun. Start off the Christmas Parade day with a, a 5K and then enjoy the Christmas Parade right after. So again, we really appreciate all of the support we have through the foundation, through our community. We could not do it without the businesses and our sponsors that we have throughout the year. And we have some really exciting events this month in October. We have our rummage sale on um, Saturday, October 12th. This is through the district. Um, they are putting that on at the community center. We have the spooky swim at the, ex at the aquatic center on Friday, October 25th. We have Halloween at the Mission Oaks Dog Park on Saturday, October 26th. So if you have your animals, your dogs, get them all dressed up and get on out there. And Halloween at the park. Um, on Thursday, October 31st at the Community Center. So uh, mark those calendar dates down and uh, we'll see you out there at those fun events. Thank you. Lanny? Chairman Kelly, members of the board, tonight I would like to introduce the new president of the Camarillo Girls Softball Association, Josh Hansen, who will be doing his annual update for you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Josh Hansen. I'm the new CGSA president. I've been on the board for, this is my third year now. Um, I've held different roles, pretty heavy duty roles with uh, equipment, uniforms, and snack bar uh, in the past. Uh, Tom <clears throat> is still floating around, uh, so I have his uh, <laughs> ear if I need it. Um, so Another successful year for CGSA this last year. Uh, our numbers dropped a little bit uh, when it comes down to overall girls that were involved. We had just under 300. Uh, this year I am pushing for 325 to 350, um, mainly due to we had a lack of type marketing, uh, getting out there in the community and really being seen by other organizations or just the public. <clears throat> so we're really pushing for that. Um, we generated about 10 all-star teams this last season, um, which is awesome. We usually only have about two per division. Um, so we had our 8U and 10U divisions that actually had three all-star teams that we went out all the way down to Irvine uh, and played different, different tournaments uh, for about an eight-week span. Um, we had a successful all-star tournament here in Camarillo. Uh, overall, uh, generated some good numbers. We actually had to turn some teams away. Uh, we had so much interest. Uh, Camarillo is a great location for people to come on up. They're right next to the ocean. Uh, and we actually have some nice uh, new hotels right there by the fields. So people love coming up. Uh, it's just a way to utilize it um, and get people in, the, in, in, the, in town. Um, we are continuing our fall ball programs. Uh, we have an 8U program that we run on Sunday mornings. Um, we continue that during fall. And then we also have our heavy, heavy duty Friday night lights that's going on right now that uh, encompasses our 10U and 12U divisions. So uh, we get pretty, we have teams coming all the way from Northridge on a Friday night, uh, if you could believe that. I, I wouldn't, but I guess they want to. Um, financials, uh, everybody should have received the annual update that I have. Uh, Hopefully you guys received it. Um, I could open up to questions afterwards if you guys have questions around it. Um, we are doing a little bit deeper dive this year uh, with my financial background. I'm really getting down to the nitty gritties of the details of the numbers. So um, that way we could set positive years going forward and hopefully uh, add additional programs as we go. 
Uh, we do have a newer board, not just me, uh, but we have about six brand new board members. Uh, we had a lot of other board members, their daughters aged out, so they're now probably playing um, other travel ball or they're all the way up in high school. So uh, we have a lot of new tenacity uh, amongst the board members that they want to come in and you know really make a difference. So that's exciting to have. Uh, so hopefully, like I said, we'll see increase in numbers, uh, increase a, a lot of different things, especially on the financial side. Um, increase fundraisers, increase marketing, and so forth. Um, fundraising, we continue to do our fundraising. Uh, I talked a little bit uh, to Lania a little bit about this, and we'll continue our conversation with Park and Rex. And when it comes down to raising money to hopefully upgrade fences up there in Mission Oaks as they are starting to deteriorate uh, quite a bit. So there are some safety concerns, but we'll address it with them and see what we can do because we're uh, hoping to give them some financial push to be able to start replacing some of those fencing up there. Uh, lastly, down here I have our select program. That's just one of our big programs that we have that it keeps all-star teams together and it keeps them Camarillo based. Um, it's one of the programs that we like to push just because these girls tend to go to travel ball when they want to get more competitive. Our select program allows us to keep them in Camarillo and then still continue to go out to Southern California, Northern California, Oregon, anywhere local or you know distant, uh, wherever they want to go to play some competitive softball. So that's the core is trying to keep these girls in Camarillo and continuing to play. Uh, that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions for me? Um, I'm, uh, I'm really impressed, not only to you know what you just said, but to the questions that Lanny sent you, because he's, you know, the, Lanny knows us pretty well, you know, we've been working <laughs> together a long time, and he asked all the sort of questions that, that we normally ask, but, uh, you know, the aggressiveness with what you're looking to grow your program and grow your revenue, all that, it's exciting. I mean, we, we, we hear so often, it's hard to get young people interested, nobody wants to volunteer, we, you know, we hear all that stuff, but the reality is there's people like you out there, and we really appreciate what you're doing. It, it makes a big difference for the kids. So thank, thank you. That's all I have. No, just uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation and a great job. Thanks. Um, you Have you eight, how young do you accept them? For T-ball? Um, you don't consider you eight T-ball, do you? No, 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 sorry. So eight U is going to be seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds. Okay, and then you do run a T-ball We also? run a six U, which is five and six-year-olds, and then we run T-ball, which... I mean, to be honest, we've had kids out there as young as three, uh, but usually we get a commitment from the coaches. Hey, if, if your kid's going to be playing, you're probably going to be coaching that team. So, because we don't want to stick somebody else with a three-year-old and expect them to be happy. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about your recruiting uh, at, down at the lower levels and getting them involved. So. We yeah. seem to have a pretty good turnout, a lot of it's siblings. You know, the younger siblings will come on up. Um, softball is a very unique sport. You know, soccer, you run around a ton. Softball, you've got nine different positions out there that are played nine different ways. So when parents really like to push the envelope, they usually send them our way, and we're excited to have them. And it's very boring to stand there and wait for the ball to come to them. It I very know. much is. Our 8U <laughs> fall ball program is very boring, but it gets them ready. Okay. <laughs> how, about how many teams do you have in your Friday Night Lights? Uh, we have a total of 12. Um, that's the most we could allocate for. We just have the three Mission Oaks fields. So we can only get two, t two games off per field. So that gives us about 12 teams. So we got uh, it, this year we have eight 12U teams and then uh, four 10U teams. Okay. Thank you. Great presentation. Succinct to the point. Uh, obviously, you've uh, been barraged with a bunch of questions. Looks like there's 16 questions here that was asked. I think that's way too many people who do your job. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sh did you participate in these responses to these questions? They were pretty much all my responses. That's what I figured. <laughs> uh, but everybody that volunteers doesn't have time to sit around and answer this many questions, especially some of them really, in my humble opinion, uh, are none of our business. So uh, I'm hoping that in the future, I don't think most of these questions came from the board. I think most of them came from the staff. Um, so I'm hoping in the future that you're not barraged by a bunch of uh, questions like this. You've got plenty to do. Try to keep your program intact. You've got 
pressures coming from everywhere. You got, like you said, kids wanting to go play travel ball, be more competitive. Uh, you never know from day to day what's uh, on the horizon. Uh, so thank you for what you do. We need the program. And it sounds like they have somebody in charge that can get it done. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Chairman Kelly, members of the board, general manager, staff, guests, and viewers at home. I'm Eric Story, your Recreation Services Manager, and tonight we're going to do a quick recap of the summer concert series for this year. All right, so a brief background, um, quick summary to the point is 2018, the Camarillo Arts Council decided they didn't want to do any more. Uh, City of Camarillo approached us, asked if we were interested in partnership in producing this event. Uh, we presented to the board in January with guidance, came back in February, the board voting 5-0 to support this partnership as a one-year uh, go-around. So part of, the summer <clears throat> part of the summer concert series involved all these items. So we crowdsourced the genres. So by that, the community was able to select the top four um, genres that we would then select bands. Uh, we also interviewed the audio um, as well as the light and sound providers. Uh, we had performers apply as well as did, conducted interviews with district staff. Um, we developed marketing and branding. We did outreach with our community partners. Uh, we developed staffing plans, developed the logistics, as well as the tracking and reporting. All this took countless hours by countless staff, and I'll touch on that more later. So here's just a couple slides uh, of pictures of what happened, and we still do not know if this is the real Bono and the Edge. Um, <laughs> Vote is still out on that. All right, so the Summer Concert Series, um, it's, it's really not possible without partners without people wanting to be there, wanting to produce the event. So um, obviously the city, they were big in, in the funding and support. Rock City Studios really stepped up in terms of providing the sound and lighting as well as some of the technical expertise that we really needed. Uh, Camarillo Acorn, they threw in marketing and advertising support. Uh, Oakmont, of Cal Oakmont of Camarillo provided financial support, produced this event. Uh, food trucks showed up in mass to provide a unique change to this event this year, something that tr tr traditionally has not been done. Um, and then the residents, they showed up in mass to, to these events. So again, we had reggae calypso, country bluegrass, rhythm and blues, and rock and roll on those dates. Um, you can see here, this is just a wide, wide angle. Is that Emily? Wide angle shot? Is that? OK, wide angle shot. Um, our resident marketing expert took all these photos for us. Um, Obviously, community feedback is pretty good. We estimate about 10,000 people showed up to these, these four events. Um, some had lower attendance, some had a little bit higher. All right, so some of the financials. Um, to answer some of the questions from February, Chairman Kelly, I know you wanted to make sure that this did not escalate, spiral out of control. Um, so we put in cost controls, and Leo and I, as well as the rest of the events team, um, really hammered down the numbers to make sure that we were tracking and reporting our expenses accurately. Um, so again, these are all the line items. Here's what was budgeted. Here's what was actually spent. Um, savings or overage. So this was personnel, service and supplies. We had a savings of $10,000 there. Overall, we had a savings of $5,800 to include the contingency. On the revenue side, so our food trucks, our community partnerships, and our donations equated to $5,600. This does not include $1,500 from the Camarillo Acorn to provide marketing and kind support, um, nor does this account for any type of cost savings that we generated from um, operational efficiencies. So specifically, the, the setup and breakdown of traditionally the light tower in the middle of Constitution Park, we didn't have to do that this year because of Rock City's um, expertise. So that was a huge savings of about $2,800. The biggest question was, did attendees have fun? Um, these are, this is a band that came out and played. We had people dancing, which was something new this year. Um, people set up early, enjoyed themselves. Um, shameless plug is yes, we had our uh, Camarillo Christmas Parade, hashtag a cosmic Christmas. Um, our astronaut showed up. These are more attendees. Oakmont of, Cal uh, Oakmont of Camarillo showed up with their uh, giant Jenga. Again, more dancing, more people having fun. 
Um, it looks like everybody did have fun and smiled. Um, more dancing again, our astronaut again. Uh, more dancing. <laughs> There's Mike. <clears throat> um, so it's, it's really important, a couple things. Um, definitely want to say thank you to the staff. Um, and by name, uh, Jane Robb, sitting back, Bev Dransfeld. Um, from the city side, Carmen, John, Kevin, and Michelle, huge support. Um, Connor, Connor, so <laughs> important note, this is Connor for people viewing at home. He's by, by practice, he's our event manager. Now in the events world, you, you don't typically get a chance to really take a breather during the event and really observe what you've produced. Um, I wanna say thank you to Emily for this candid shot of him. Um, most of our events, he never really gets a break and that's by designing the events industry. Um, and secondly is, speaking of Emily again, she is really never on this side of the camera. So as she was escorting our, our astronaut around, um, it's really important that we got a picture of her finally. Um, but really huge support and huge thank you for all the staff, um, both our side and the city of Camarillo for their support in producing this event. And to follow up on a couple items from our February meeting, uh, Director Mishler and Director Dixon, sponsorships were taken care of, um, not only in terms of ge generating them, but also taking care of the, the sponsors, the community partners, once they were on site. It wasn't just t get taken care of and then we'll see you later. We took care of them every step of the process. Um, Director Molloy, in terms of growing in the future, uh, Mary and I are having conversations with the city uh, next week to see what we wanna do in terms of 2020, which we will definitely seek guidance and feedback from the board. Um, it is also important to note that you mentioned that this was a, a huge opportunity for us to work in collaboration with the city director, and I think that um, the feedback we received not only from our staff, city staff, and the residents really proved to that point that we did work in collaboration and we produced a, a really great event. Um, all of our vendors and our partners did pay on time, director. <clears throat> Um, <laughs> we did create uh, post-event surveys. We had uh, roughly 200 of them, so we got a lot of great feedback from participants uh, as well as the bands and our partners in terms of what, if we were to do this again, what we could do better. So that's an important note. Um, Director Dixon, the chair policy wasn't too much of a problem with advance notice, uh, making sure our marketing messages were on point. So to answer that question. Uh, volunteers, Director Mishler, we did not have too many groups that that reached out, um, that's an opportunity for next year to improve and, and really develop those partnerships and, and collaboration further. And uh, Chairman Kelly mentioned the um, not letting financials spiral out of control, so we, we took care of that. Um, and again, just thank you all for allowing us to produce this event. And uh, Director Magner, to your point, it, it did test my event management experience a little, but more importantly is our events team, our marketing team, our community partnerships team, it challenged them as well, and they were able to grow and learn and become better, more equipped staff for any opportunities that may um, pre present itself in the future. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. This is the question you probably can't answer, but well, I, I've attended two of the four events. I was out of town for the other two, but I'm trying to get a, a feedback. Do we know, do we have different, obviously some of the people attended all four, or they just attend no matter who shows up, but do we have a different mix of people who attend the different performances or do we don't really have a handle on that? So we're still pulling the data from, from online, which is not necessarily accurate, because you can always just say I'm attending and then find something else to do. Um, in terms of boots on the ground and counting and, and identifying, we really, right now, uh, other than making this a ticketed event, which we are not advocating by any means, trying to pull those types of, that type of data and analytics is, is pretty challenging. Um, I, I think from the pictures and the, the surveys we got back, um, there's some room for improvement across everything that we do, and I think that's something we'll, we'll strive for in this event as well as all events moving forward. I, I have to say I uh, had many friends who attended a few, and I have some friends who attended all, and I never heard, never got a bad comment out of it, and they loved the dancing, and never heard a word about uh, the chair situation, so... Um, I think with the uh, 
you know, public announcements and things like that that really worked, Eric. So uh, good job to you and the staff, so, and to the city who, who worked with us, so. Yeah. And I know there's a survey. Is the, is the survey completed or is it still ongoing? The survey is completed. We closed it Monday at 5 p.m. so we could analyze the data and then be able to put it in as part of the report to the city. Okay. So so we'll get a follow-up on what that what yeah. that data yes. shows. And uh, now you, uh, congratulations on really stepping up on re really pretty short notice and producing a really good event. I think it was a real positive for the city and for, for the district. Thanks. I want to echo what Doc Dixon just said. Uh, uh, it worked out a lot better than I thought it was going to, uh, and you guys did it on a tight budget. I, um, and and so great for to you and all the staff for pulling this off. Um, two areas, uh, I attended three of the four. Um, two areas I think that um, that maybe it's possible to really even step it up a little bit more and that is I think we may have to negotiate for a little more dough to uh, uh, so that we can attract some of the talent that uh, uh, is available out there um, the other is in the food truck area everybody knows that so I'm, I'm really I know preaching to the choir here uh, I noticed when I was there everybody was bringing food from somewhere else. And so I think we missed out on a lot of it. I know it wasn't anybody at, at Rec and Park that uh, caused food vendors not to come to the event or they may have been booked or, or had commitments or whatever. But uh, I, I went to the food trucks and uh, the cuisine was somewhat limited. So I think if somehow we can persuade some high-end food trucks to come that we can make more money and uh, it'll be better for the people uh, who come to the events at any rate those are just my passing thoughts great job to everybody who uh, got this done thanks Eric thank you This is a time for public comment. I do not have any yellow cards uh, here on my desk, so are there any cards out there that I do not have? Would anyone like to speak? No. You want to speak? No. All right. We're gonna, Leo's going to introduce a new staff member, so. Okay. Chairman Kelly, members of the board, I'd like to introduce to you a new staff member of Pleasant Valley Rec and Park District. Jessica Puckett, she is um, our new admin analyst, and she sits right behind me. If you want to come up over here, <laughs> she comes to us from the Dallas, Texas P Park and Rec District. Or I'm sorry, Dallas, Texas Park and Recs. She's originally from Raleigh, North Carolina. She's been in government for 16 years. She has her bachelor's of science in recreation admin. She's certified in Parks and Rec professional, and she's a certified aquatics facility operator. So thank you for joining us, and this is our board. <laughs> well, pleased to meet you. Hi. Tell, tell us a little bit more about you, yourself. Um, as Leo said, I am, have been in Parks and Recreation for a total of about 20 years, uh, working 16. Um, I have a background starting out in seniors, youth programming, and um, working all the way up into prior administration level for departments. Um, I'm originally from North Carolina, born and raised. I was in Texas for the last year and a half, and i um, glad to come to California and learn a new system and, and a new way of life. So it's been a, a great adventure so far, and I've enjoyed it. Do you like the weather? <laughs> I, I do. It has been different. I keep waiting for it to get, get cold. So <laughs> but, uh, but I'm enjoying it because I do like hot weather. So absolutely. Go ahead. I was going to say, get in, by California standards, it has been cold. 
<laughs> and and uh, welcome to California. We don't see too many people coming from North Carolina here. It's usually the, the other way around. But, so. I thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, I I'm used to used to it as well. So, um, but glad to be here. It's it's been a pleasure so far. The staff has been wonderful, and just getting to know everybody. Um, and we've dived right in. So already getting to work. Oh, I've I've met Jessica. Oh, okay. So we. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Consent oh, I didn't get to finish a little while ago. Seeing that we have no one wishing to speak in the public comments uh, uh, section, uh, we will move on. Consent agenda. I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda. No second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Dixon? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Mishler? Aye. Chairman Kelly? Aye. Item 8, public hearing. Good evening, Chairman Kelly and members of the board. So tonight, I'm going to do the second reading of Ordinance 10. Um, to talk about board compensation. So as you know, we've been over this before. Um, the district goes over this um, every couple of years. Um, there's a couple government codes that talk about this. Um, Public Resource Code Section 5784.15. Um, there's two state laws that address this. Um, Chapter 4, Recreation and Parks District, Article 5. Um, boards of Directors and Officers, Parks 5784.15, and the Water Code Section 20202. So the existing law, all of this verbiage basically is sitting here telling you that um, to receive compensation for more than six meetings of a board um, in a calendar month, um, you could pass a um, policy for this, but there has to be... Um, finding um, some substantial evidence saying that um, you need to have more than um, uh, five meetings to be paid for that. Uh, we found that that is not needed. So water code section 20202 provides the following, and this is discussing that the, provo the um, proposed ordinance, which would increase the board's members' compensation by 5%, which is $5, to $105 for each day of service, not to exceed five days in a calendar month. So it is recommended the board review and approve the following. Number one, a motion to approve a second reading by title only of propo proposed ordinance number 10 and waive further reading of the ordinance. And number two, a motion to adopt ordinance number 10 revise the first sentence of section number one of resolution number 583 to increase the amount of compensation for each director for each day's attendance at meetings of the board or for each day's service rendered as a director by request of the board to $105. I have a motion to read the complete ordinance number 10 title and to waive further reading. I move that the board secretary conduct a second reading by title only of proposed ordinance number 10 and waive further reading of the ordinance. I second that motion. Do we, do we have to vote on? Do. Director Magner? Aye. Director Dixon? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Mishler? Aye. Chairman Kelly? Aye. Okay. So, ordinance number 10, an ordinance of the Board of Directors of the Pleasant Valley Rec Recreation and Park District setting board members' compensation. Does the board wish any discussion? Do I have a motion to adopt ordinance number 10? I make a motion to adopt ordinance number 10, revise the first sentence of section 1 of resolution number to uh, 583 to increase, increase the amount of compensation for each director for each day's attendance at meetings of the board or for each day's service rendered as a director by the request of the board to $105. Second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Dixon? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Mishler? 
Aye. Chairman Kelly. Aye. And can I get mine in gold? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and as my father would say, don't spend it all in one, one place. place. <laughs> Item number nine, new items. A, consideration and approval of the design construction plans for the aquatic center, shower, and dressing room design remodel. Good evening, Chairman Kelly, members of the board. Uh, tonight, coming to you to approve the design mm -hmm. of the, uh, the remodel phase in the, at the aquatic center. So, part of the 2019-20 uh, uh, capital improvements uh, that was brought to the to the board uh, for the redesign that was approved. Um, the board appropriated uh, $500,000 in Quimby funds to take care of this project. On September 4th, we, uh, we you, the board, um, select the Leach Mount Architects to design and draw new plans for the shower design in that PBA, uh, Pleasant Valley Aquatic Center. The Aquatic Center is one of the most frequently used facilities. Uh, we get about 90,000 people a year there. Um, it's open seven days a week, about 15 hours a day. And in the late 80s, it was remodeled. Uh, you can see the, the bathroom design kind of shows it, a little southwestern style. The lobby used to be that same design. Uh, we did that, I think, around uh, 2007 or so, um, six, 2006, excuse me, right in front of me. Um, the envelope, again, we did that last year, and prior to that, uh, 2007, we did all the pool and everything. but. But last year we did the pool again with the uh, fiberglass in it and the redo the all the metal on the uh, slide. So the original design of both the men's and women's, they're identical, just reversed. Um, there's eight showers, um, with one being ADA, with a bench seat also. Um, the dressing rooms are about five to 600 square feet right now. Um, there's one hand dryer and there's three benches in those dressing rooms and, uh, and a uh, set of lockers also. So the re redesign will bring privacy to the showers, um, up upgrade the modern, uh, the locker room in modern style. We would make that smaller, uh, which I'll get to. Um, again, indiv individual shower stalls will have uh, privacy walls with a curtain, so you have privacy. Um, there will be about three feet average size. Um, we'll put two additional separate ADA stalls and those will be done inside the dressing room area. I'll, again, I'll show you a picture of it. Um, we'll be adding metering valves, not the ones you have to pay for, it just it meters to how long you're in there. 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, that kind of, that's what, that's what a metering valve is. Um, we'll put all new flooring on the, on the walls, tile, the, the walls, the ceiling and the showers. Uh, we'll put a new sink in, new sinks, excuse me. Uh, the ones we have are quite old and they're getting chipped up. We'll do new mirrors also, minor stuff there. Um, right now, there's a big, about an eight to ten foot glass with a door that you walk from the dressing room to the to the uh, showers through out to the pool. That will be gone. We'll remove that. Um, over the years, we've re repaired it, repaired it, repaired it. Don't really see a need to have it, so we'll probably do away with that. Um, we'll put a shelf in in the dry, the dress, dressing room area. We'll put a shelf um, so people can get in there and do their makeup and their hair and ready get ready for work. We'll put a new uh, efficient heaters in there. The ones we have are original. They need to come out. Um, we're, we're right now they're banded them together. And we'll put all new T-bar ceiling in. It's showing the signs of rust. We've, we've painted it years, years and years. So it's time for a new one, tear it out. So this is, I wish I had a better picture. I'm sorry, I don't. I, I can't, can we make it bigger at all? So anyways, um, this, this is the men's side. So this is a big dressing room. This is where the, right here is where the mirror, the window is. We'll, we'll remove this and we'll put right here will be the new ADA. Yeah, right there will be all the new, new ADA showers. So that'll be inside the dressing room. So they'll have their own little area. We have to put, all, we have to put plumbing in there. We have drains in here now, which has a tie into them. Um, and then this will become eight, so yeah, no, seven showers, excuse me. Yeah, seven showers. There's one in the bottom one, which we'll take that one out. So that'll become seven showers. I'm sorry on, on the, when I wrote it. And then uh, they'll put a bent, a, 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 like a, a bar top or countertop right here. 
in the dressing room. We'll pull the electrical on the other side. We have electrical on, a, on, a, on the back side now. Was it by the sinks? We'll do it with that because it's not, I don't like that idea. We reverse it, put it in the, in the dressing room. Now people get ready for work. So. Bob, on those number of showers, I thought it was six on the plan. Am I mistaken? No, seven. Because that is the plan right here. Well, I so see six. One, two, I... three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, that bottom one. Yeah. Okay, I didn't. Yeah, where you walk in. That, that's one right there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Bob, where's the hot water heater in relation to these two sets of showers? Way over here. Oh, my goodness. That's in the maintenance room. It's those, uh, last year we put in uh, the four tankless water heaters. That's what feeds the whole thing. So we, we don't even have a tank. It's just a, it's four uh, tankless water heaters. It, res it recirculates then? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, and that's gotten better. We haven't had as many complaints throughout that last couple of years. Um, we've gotten it dialed in. We've got some, uh, uh, the city water's not the best. So we got to clean out our filters quite often on the, on the tankless water heaters. So we get a lot of particles in it. But elsewise, uh, we're doing pretty good with it. Um, again, it's, it's being, the, 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 the concerns have dropped down. Any other questions on the picture? Doesn't look like. Okay. And again, again, here it is, a little bigger one. So, and, and the women's identical, just reversed. The women's actually has this in there now as a dressing room, separate, separate dressing room, but no showers. And we still have room on the corner. We can make that a closet. We can do whatever we can put in there. And these will become all hard, hard walls. Um, even these will be hard walls up to the ceiling. So they don't go anywhere. So right now there's no fiscal impact at this time. It's recommended board uh, directors uh, provide direction and approve the design plans for Pleasant Valley Aquatic Center, showers and dressing room. Any discussion or questions on this subject? Go ahead, Mike. Mike. Go ahead. Bob, uh, uh, help me out with the, I'm just wondering about the, the heating and air conditioning aspects of those two rooms. Does each, does each room have their own setting for that? Or are they different? Or are they on the same one? Or they're, they're, is there a pretty good circulation in there? Yes, there's good circulation in there. There's a, there's a vents inside the shower itself. Um, we looked at the, with the architect, uh, Brandon, and I went up there with the ladders and looked up there and to check out the heating and ventilation. And uh, right now it's no concerns. Um, their, their thermostats are set inside the uh, lobby area. In a, uh, oh, so there's one setting in the lobby that runs right. that whole front of the building. For the, for the men's and, and, then the, and then the separate side for the women's. So there's two separate thermostats. Oh, okay. So and, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure there's good circulation and get rid of the humidity. So. Right, right. And you're thinking we're okay on that? Yes, it was, it was when I first started, there was an issue. Um, the walls were peeling and everything. Um, the walls were green inside the pool area, the envelope. Uh, we got the, all the air handlers working. We, that problem's gone. The, uh, the dressing rooms, a lot of the problem was they're in there hosing them out with water. You can't put water on paint every night. It's going to start bubbling and blistering. So we stopped that. Now use them off. So and that, and that took care of that right away on that one years ago. So everything, everything else is working fine. Yeah, thank on, you. On ventilation. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I got a question. I know those, those timed water valves, you just press it again when you want to stay in longer, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. But it keeps people from leaving it on and then leaving right. and wasting right. a lot of water. Okay. I know that was a problem we had before. Yeah, and there's a lot of working parts in those. Um, so they've gotten better over the years. So you know, I think we'll go back to them now. Yeah. Okay. Have That's all I have. Yeah. Are, are they preset for a time? You can adjust them. Okay. So, okay. yes, but you can I adjust I mean, them. we can adjust them or the people can no, adjust we, them? we can. Okay. We've got to take them, pull them apart and do some changing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, a couple, a couple questions. Uh, the, the number of uh, ADA uh, showers, is, is that... Then there's two of them, right? Correct. Yes. And is that is that uh, a ratio of number of ADA to non-ADA showers that's mandated by law, or did we just choose that number? We we had one originally in there, mm -hmm. and we chose putting another one. Okay. Just just because we we had the room. Okay. And if we're going to do it, let's make it now. 
Okay, so there's, so it's, it's there, not, there's a code, but we, we're in that code. Okay. We're actually exceeding it. Okay. And secondly, the, 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 uh, where you have lockers uh, on the, against the wall, are those is 11, I counted 11 little boxes. Is that accurate to the number of, sh of uh, lockers that are going to be there? Or is that just a, it's just just a no, sketch? There's, there's probably 50. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So I was going to say 11 doesn't seem like very many. No, there's, there's probably oh. 50 in each, in okay. each uh, men's and women's. Okay. They need some, they need some uh, DLC. We have to get new locks for them and keys and... Okay, so and the uh, and what is the T bar ceiling? It's it's the stuff in your office. Oh, is that drop ceiling with yes, the with the acoustic? Okay, okay, yes, okay. All right, that's that's it. Thank you. Motion. Motion. Oh, thank you. I'll make a motion. I guess for something to approve the design and oh, construction I'll, plans. Yeah. I will make a motion to approve the design and construction plans for the aquatic center, showers, and dressing room. I'll second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Dixon? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Mishler? Aye. Chairman Kelly? Aye. Next item is B, consideration and approval of resolution number 638, adopting a district social media policy. Good evening again. Eric Story, your recreation services manager. Um, tonight I bring before you a district social media policy. All right, so currently we do not have a policy um, that governs the hows and whys of which we use social media. And by that, I mean Twitters, Facebooks, Instagrams, even the website. Um, so the intended purpose behind this is to establish a policy by which uh, we disseminate information from the district uh, about the district to our residents. <clears throat> so a little background. Um, currently provide information in a number of ways. Um, print, so that being newspapers, magazines, banners, even our activity guide. Um, digital being social media, some of those things I mentioned before. The website as well as our email marketing. Uh, site activations, 10 by 10 booths at our events or at other community events that we attend, um, as well as word of the mouth. So as a practice right now, um, our marketing specialist is, is the one who manages most of those communications from the district to our residents. And we're talking about bulk information, not one-on-one -on -one interactions, although she does a lot of that online as well. Um, one administrative correction to this, we do have uh, two others that do post things to the district's website, whether it be HR in terms of jobs and things like that, or others uh, who put up RFPs. So this, this policy would encompass all that. So analysis, so this policy, all three pages, is broken down into two categories. One is the general policy, and that uh, includes uh, items that are administrative and functions, so legal requirements, record keeping, so SB 929, which is the district's requirement to have a website, that would encompass that, as well as the California Public Records Act. Um, the, this policy would conform to those specific items, as well as any other federal, state, and local um, rules, laws, things like that. Um, but specifically for this policy, we're going to focus on the comments portion. So it's the process by which we monitor and basically control what's going on within our own uh, social media. So a couple things. Um, this policy will allow, it, it will outline items that may, that the district may, doesn't have to, may um, remove. Um, so submissions, comments, likes, things like that, that we may deem in this policy, three pages, uh, that may be offensive, obscene, inflammatory, unlawful, threatening, harassing, illegal, defamatory, de defamatory. <laughs> Uh, slanderous or hostile, and that could be towards an individual or another entity within this. And the impetus or the, the catalyst for this policy is we have faced items like this, um, as well as this is a topic, and Director Magner, if you can chime in as well, with CSDA. Um, and we've gotten this policy specifically from CSDA as well as legal in terms of what other agencies are doing as, they're, as the landscape is changing and more and more agencies are doing specific marketing and dedicated marketing, and they're bringing on staff to manage those items, this is becoming um, a hot topic. So these are some of the, the items that this policy will allow us to monitor and control. Um, so to continue on that, 
um, offensive remarks, discrimination on any of those items, um, as well as anything else that's protected, um, whether it be with federal, state, or local laws, um, as well as any comments or actions, advertising, whatnot, that may be considered illegal. Um, so currently with this policy, there is no fiscal impact. Um, a lot of things that we are doing currently fall within this scope. Uh, actually, everything we do currently falls within the scope of this, uh, for clarification on that. Um, and there are some other items in here that is in the staff report as well as in the policy. So you'll start to see initials at the end of specific posts that will identify the staff member who may be posting. So if tomorrow I say good morning, everyone, you'll see at the bottom, yes, um, as a way to track and identify um, as part of the policy. So I'm happy to answer questions on this. Um, and it is recommended that the Board of Directors approve Resolution 638, adopting a district social media policy. Um, I'm, I'm really glad we're doing this because as we've done more and more of this, I've been more, more concerned about where it leads. And I recently saw an instance where one of our promotions for the concert series was used by a member of the public to leverage comments about another issue of interest to him and basically used our marketing uh, efforts to promote his uh, item. And um, I noticed in the policy that that's specifically excluded. So, you know, I, I don't want to see that because I, I want social media to be useful to people and have everybody want to follow us and see what we're doing and not have it become a a, a source of argumentation. It's, it's really there to communicate to people what we're doing and, and let them know what's available to them to do. So um, I, don't, I don't think that's in general a problem, but I'm glad to see that we have a way to deal with it. And also I like the idea of having individual members comment because when I, when I read something from, say, the pool site, you know, the aquatic center site. I'm, I'm guessing, is that Macy or is that Emily or, you know, so, so you know, n now I'll be able to know because when we comment as individuals, everyone can see it came from us individually, but when it's from a district account, then it, and that would help people to direct further questions to the person as well. So I'm, I'm glad to see we're moving forward on this. John? No. Um, Eric, the this covers the foundation post too. Am I correct? Uh, so that's going to be uh, brought up within a foundation board meeting. Uh, oh, this okay. So we need to take a, it to them first. As an example, as okay. a model, a um, couple changes to words, and we can make it make it a reality. Okay. Okay. And then will we have to bring this back to put them in, or? Um, so not? my understanding is the the foundations board governs their actions. Um, so as soon as this is adopted within the foundations board, it would also cover. Uh, the foundation as a separate legal entity. Okay. And what about retention? Um, I know we discussed it, um, and now that we're going to the <clears throat> two years, um, we will have, I, I'm assuming you're, you're going to catalog it so that it's not going to take us forever to find something or, or whatever? Yes. Yeah, so anything that, um, that falls under our current retention policy or anything under the California... Um, Records Request Act, yes. um, we will definitely follow. And in terms of practice, if there is anything that we do need to take down, um, I'm not even going to create any examples right now. Um, what we'll do is we'll take screenshots, uh, date time stamps, as well as categorize it in our files. So that way we can reference it should we need to. Okay, very good. Thank you. No, I'm good. I'm happy we're doing this. Thanks. Me too. I'll make a motion to approve resolution uh, 638, adopting a district social media policy. I'll second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Mishler? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Dixon? Aye. Chairman Kelly? Aye. <coughs> Next, we have uh, item C, consideration approval of resolution number 639, adopting the updated general use policy. Good evening, Chairman Kelly, members of the board. Uh, tonight, I stand here in front of you to uh, hopefully walk us through uh, approving the uh, updated general use policy. So as a quick summary, 
uh, due to uh, recommended changes from the district council to ordinance number eight and uh, district staff and the policy committee have taken the opportunity to review and update the general use policy. The uh, general use policy is uh, uh, actually a policy that is required to be adopted by the district uh, in accordance with ordinance number eight that ge uh, governs the general use of district parks and facilities, thus the name. The current policy we operate under is uh, uh, from July 2015. And the primary uh, changes that are, uh, that are of concern tonight are uh, changes regarding use of alcohol and reservations within the park, uh, the park system. And uh, furthermore, there has been a uh, section added specifically dealing with community service organizations as well. And uh, the general use policy basically provides the background for, for staff uh, and the public in regards to the operation or the reservation or usage of the park system. It outlines processes regarding reservations, permits, fees, charges, classifications of use, priority of use, et cetera. Uh, however, it doesn't include things specifically like fees. Those are typically reserved for the fee schedule. Over the three years, since 2017, uh, we have had two different policy committees uh, review the policy and various staff members. So the policy changes outlined tonight are uh, as follows. Uh, I just want to make sure that there's a note here that uh, there are a number of minor grammatical, spelling, clerical changes that happen within the policy uh, just to clean it up after years of editing. Uh, and most of the changes uh, in the policy were made in regards to ordinance number eight's requirement that any reservation involving alcohol be signed by a member of the public who's over the age of 21 rather than 18, which was not specified prior. So the, uh, bolded, action, uh, the bolded items on the slides you see here are uh, the items that are highlighted in the new policy that we've, uh, and then the action here, and, and then the item here is what we've done um, to that policy, what the change we've made essentially. So I'll just run through these really quickly. Uh, section 1C, request for waiver of fees, that section has been removed in entirety. 1T, a liability insurance section was moved to an exhibit and now it's tied to changes in the Capri requirements as established um, by the insurance, well, by Capri, obviously. Uh, 1U, required insurance, has been moved with 1T to the insurance exhibit. 2A, priority is use of athletic facilities. Priority of use was removed and referred to section 1, 1, uh, or sorry, 1I. <laughs> and the section title was changed to additional charges over basic rate for athletic facilities. 2B, additional changes or additional charges over basic rate for athletic facilities. That's the title that we, uh, we were just uh, referring to. It specifies charges for portable toilets, dumpsters, any additional equipment, cleaning or staffing, above and beyond normal operating uh, or normal operations. 2C, additional fees for athletic facilities. This section was renamed athletic facilities hours of operation to more closely reflect the actual content of the section. And text uh, was added requiring permits on site, which uh, prior was this was not required, including operating hours to change or uh, change to match ordinance number eight. The general, uh, the general use policy actually didn't match ordinance number eight. When ordinance number eight takes precedence. Section three, nonprofit rental use. Community service organizations were included in this section prior. They've been moved into their own section. And 501c4 organizations were removed as those organizations are specifically political advocacy organizations. Uh, this section was restated to clarify the reduced fee eligibility that certain nonprofit or organizations uh, enjoy, and the request for a waiver of fees was removed from this section. Section four, community service organizations, was added. It defines the district relationship and expectations for the organizations. And section five, sales, solici sales solicitation and unlawful advertising was restated in entirety. It essentially states the same thing, but now it's stated a little more clearly. So there is no fiscal impact from this, uh, from this action. And it is staff's recommendation that the board review and, and approve resolution 639 adopting the updated general use policy. You want me to start? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, do you have a, I, I to, well, I'm, let me start with page three of 17 of the policy, which is page 101, 111 on our um, handout. And I'm looking down there for deposits and deposits item number uh, three, uh, III down there. 
It, the last sentence says refundable cleaning security deposit will be refunded for cancellations made 30 days in advance. Um, that means, that I'm obviously, that assumes that if you cancel within 25 days, you don't get your? That would appear to be so. Am I mistaken on that? You still get the refundable back. Well, I'm confused then on the wording of that. Can you help me? You see what I'm, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> If I just read that, it, it, one interpretation of that is you have to make your refund request with 30 days in advance or more to get your, I mean, if I read that sentence that way, am I reading that sentence correct? That's how I read it. I mean, that's yeah. what, and so that's why I'm asking the question here is to me that doesn't make any sense. If I may, Director, that would probably be the intent. If I, if I remember correctly, this was not changed within the committee. Well, that's, I'm, I'm not questioning that. I'm just trying to, I'm just reading this and saying that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I would propose that, I mean, that we do some rewording on that or something here. I mean, we can, we can work that now or we can go back and bring it back later. I'm not, is there a timeline on this for, to get this done tonight or next month or anything, Mary? Well, at some point we need to get this done because we have stuff that's in here that is not following the ordinance, so we need the ordinance in this to match. No, 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 I, no, I, I just understand, but do you want tonight, if I go through here and start identifying issues, potential issues, do we want to work the exact wording tonight or have this go back to the committee and then come back with a proposed rework? I think That'd it would depend on how much changes you have. So, like, for this one is the intent... Is, is if this is a simple one that we can fix, then I would say fix it well, now and then we can go. Up. Well, that's what I'm saying. If it's something simple that we can fix, then I would suggest that we fix it. If it's something that's going to take much more and needs to go back to policy, then. So the question on this one is, if somebody cancels within 30 days, do they lose their entire, their their entire rental and deposit? Well, is that the cutoff 30 days or? I'm hearing that if you make it 25 days in advance, you, you get your cleaning and security deposit back, correct? Is there, is what we're doing or something? I'm just trying to understand. In, in practice, it looks like that's the case. I, is, Karen, is there, a, is there a minimum time frame that you usually go by? Uh, refundable to us, uh, it was, it's always refundable unless there's an issue which it describes in uh, B2 there. If there's an issue with it not being left clean right. or destroyed or something. Well, well, what, I'm, if, what I'm concerned about is if something, if, an, if a group or individual uh, rents one of our outdoor picnic areas or something, and, you know, the day before, uh, I'm not talking about the weather, but what if there's a fire, like we had these fires and all the smoke and people can't go out there because of all the smoke, are they going to lose their security deposit because they didn't cancel 30 days in advance? Generally, you see what I'm saying? With this, because it, the reading of this says they will. Right. And they and they and they would, but so if we don't use extremes, let's because an extreme like that would be something we would probably and we close classes and such, we would probably either give them a refund and or um, ask them that they wanted to change the date. Probably a better thing would be to say four days before your reservation, you decided you didn't want to have that reservation and you just canceled for no apparent reason or just decided not to. So at that point, as usually industry standard, you wouldn't get something back because you have now had a date and time and somebody else could have had the date and time, but you can no longer rent that out. No, I, I agree so. with the concept that you don't want someone you know, they may book five different sites in five different locations or something across Correct. the county. And then at the last minute, pick which one they want to go to. And you don't want people doing that because they're preventing other people from using that site potentially. So I understand that. Um, do we want to have a discussion right now over how many days to pick? I, I just had a question real quick. Um, just regarding that, this, this paragraph or the uh, section, I believe what the intent is is if somebody cancels 30 day, under 30 days, they don't get any of the monies they've paid already, they wouldn't get any of that back. But if part of that was a refundable deposit, they would get that back. So that 
one sentence could mean um, the refundable cleaning slash security deposit will still be refunded for cancellations made 30 days in advance. Well, still. Does that make sense? Maybe just one, one word in there. What is it possible to just add that the party can appeal to the general manager well, for a waiver? If, for instance, if you get somebody that cancels on the 29th day, uh, I'm sure that Mary would say, that's close, that's close enough, you know? Uh, maybe she wouldn't, but <laughs> I, I would think that the facts would di dictate, you know, what the action was going to be. Um, and at that point, she would find out, why are you canceling? Well, it's just because we decided not to do it. Well, maybe that's a little, you handle it that way. If, uh, if it's, the, like Mike suggested, smoke, fire, some other calamity, um, then uh, the, the general manager has a discretion to give a waiver. That's how I would do it. Well, it's a lot easier. If we're going to, just following up on what Karen said, maybe we can say uh, the refundable cleaning slash security deposit will still be refunded for cancellations made up to, uh, made up to, say, seven days in advance. Does that make any sense, what I just said there? It depends what the intent is of this sentence. It just sounds to me like there's enough variations in this whole thing that maybe this is not the place to discuss it. Maybe it does need to go back to committee just to clarify the language on this, especially if you've got quite a number of these to Yeah. To oh, I have a few have more. So, yeah. okay, well, why don't we, I would, well, I would recommend that what we would do tonight is we identify potential issues. If I'm the only one, then we don't have to. But if we agree that there's some potential issue there, it should go back to committee to work out the wording and then come back to us. The, one of the problems, of course, is, um, well, I guess it's not a problem. It doesn't matter. We, we can pass this as it is now, but just with the, with the direction to go back and revisit some of these things. To well, you don't know what you're order. passing. You, you can, but but you would basically be doing another resolution and passing a new policy. Yeah. But if you need this, but if you need this, you need this policy. There, there's passed. more. There, there's there's another level of this that we haven't talked about because there's really two kinds of fees people pay. There's the rental part for the use of it, and that gives them the reservation and and eliminates us for lining up somebody else. So the timing of when you would get that money back versus the timing on a security deposit and cleaning that seems different to me. I agree completely. I, I, to me, why should you pay a security and cleaning deposit if you didn't use the place? But the rental part, that's different. And I, yes. and I, I understand we need a cancellation policy to make sure people don't make reservations they're not going to use. So I think on this that's issue... That's probably better yes. discussed with other staff members and done offline. So Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, we've been down this road before where we sat in a meeting like this and go, we, we went over what the intent behind the paragraph it actually is, but six or seven years goes by and new staff comes in and somebody looks at it and says, well, I think that that means this. And maybe some of us aren't here or maybe we don't remember and we don't have the original notes that we took and we don't really remember what we discussed. And so I kind of agree with Mike that Maybe it does need to be a little more clear. Okay. Okay, so this is one item number one, I would call it. And I'll, I'll note as we go along, Mike, which sections you're referring to, so that way we can just bring oh, okay. it. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I'm going to then move forward to um, page five, five of 17, which is page 113, 113 on ours, under E permits. Um, the sentences I'm looking at there, the district may receive the signed rental agreement, application deposits, and fees at least 30 days in advance. Now, later on, you talk about receiving it past that. Are you saying, are you, are we saying you, we recommend that? Or if someone comes in 20, if we have a facility, to me, when I read that, that wording says, if we have someone, if we have a, a particular picnic area or something that's open for um, for reservation, 
and someone wants to walk in 20 days in advance, we can't take it because it's not 30 days in advance. You see what I'm saying on the wording? I mean, the wording should actually mean something. I mean, we can't this have mis you know, we can't have two or three interpretations of what that means. I mean, to me, that, that needs to be reworked in there. Um, I'm not even sure what the intent was. So let me, I can talk to two intents with this one. One, that I don't get an application or Karen doesn't get an application 60 days in advance. I need insurance and all those things and you're two days out and I'm not getting all the stuff I need. So you really have a couple different things that we're saying that all that stuff needs to be done and in on time 30 days in advance. If you walked in, which I see where your point is with this, if you walked in 10 days before, wanted to rent something, I would rent it to you, but you would need to have all of that stuff. There's no grace period. So okay, I see well, where you're... But I think the way this understand. wording is today, it doesn't say that. Okay. We can add some that's, more language That's what I'm that. saying. It has we can add... People can misinterpret that or can interpret it in different ways. Okay. We'll add more language. can have one interpretation. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm up to page 7 of 17 which is 115. Um, I'm going to start at the very top, um, which is the following up from the uh, B picnic area of the page before. And then it says, um, starting um, the first sentence up on top of page 7, says outside items, i.e. tables, slash, comma, shares, and barbecues, etc., are not permitted without the approval of the general manager or designee. Okay, so I understand barbecues. You don't want people bringing in their own barbecues. But are we saying, I mean, to me, if someone brings in a little coffee table and a portable chair, now, they're technically now breaking the policy. And I don't understand, and I've been to a lot of these picnics and stuff, where I brought my own little chair sometimes or a, a little extra table for some goodies and stuff to and stuff. And so are we saying that's actually illegal? I, I understand you don't want people bringing in 20 tables when we have an area that's set up for 15. And obviously if people came in there with 20 different tables and 200 chairs, that's a problem. But somehow or another, I think that there... I mean, if you read that literally, I mean, you can't bring one extra table and a chair. Is, well, that, what you, is that the intent? Or? Mike, I don't think it says that. I think it says without the approval of the general manager. Well, okay, so if I'm going to bring a chair to a picnic er, a table reservation I made, I need to go into the general manager and get permission ahead of time? Well, uh, if I might hear, Karen, for just um, may I ask you a question? If somebody comes in and says, is it okay if I bring in... X, Y, and Z for part of this. It was that simply something as simple as saying, okay, let me check, and then getting back to them? Generally, yes. Like, honestly, if it's like, we'll, we'll say like one easy up or something for additional shade or just something minimal, it's usually not, not a, an issue. We'll, 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 we'll say it's fine. If it's an okay. issue where... Um, the reason why yeah. I bring that up is because if, if, if Mary has expressed that those kinds of things are okay, essentially... That's, she's designated. I understand, but to me, if a park ranger picked this up and is going through the area and says, hey, where's your permit that says you have an extra, I got three, you got two picnic, you got two card tables here, I don't see that on your... Uh... They're not, the rangers aren't going to stop them from that. It's mainly having people bringing tables in for, oh, here's an open spot, I'm setting up over here, and having a, a barbecue. It's mainly, for the pavilions, yeah, if you want to bring a table and chairs, we're not going to stop you. A barbecue, yes, we want a reason why a lot of people like to... No, no, I'm not even talking about barbecues. I'm, I'm just talking about tables and chairs. part of it, and we had yeah. something come up today. Yeah. Um, but it's mainly to keep people from bringing in five tables and a bunch of chairs and, and having a, a barbecue where it's not a barbecue area. No, I agree. You know, unless they get an open space permit and, and ask for this for a reason, which we had a couple of weeks ago at Pitts Ranch. We had somebody do that with uh, tents and everything. So that's mainly what it's... Covering, but again, that's what, that's not what the wording says. It's, so my issue here, and I, I know I'm being a hard nose, but I have people in the public who have complained to me about <clears throat> certain things, and I'm also reading this myself and seeing if it makes sense. And I think that needs needs some wording work I'm back to the committee. I don't know. If so the question the, the question then becomes of how many tables, how many chairs, what's too much? 
And then you go down the route, is five too much? Is 10 too much? Is two too much? Is three too much? So this is where when you just put it in the policy, and I get, I get your point, is by putting this in the policy like this, and if they're going to rent and they mention it to Karen, we can then approve that when they come in for a rental and it takes care of that on that side of it. Um, from the other side of it, it, if somebody has one chair and they're watching somebody sitting at a playground, I get that we could stop and the ranger could cite them. I could tell you that's probably never happened. And if they came to me, I would throw that site out. So it's, it's a combination of where do, you, where do you reasonably put that number? How do you reasonably put that number in there? Or do you leave it to when they're making a reservation, you ask specifically what other specifics if they need it. So for instance, when Karen does a rental, and I've seen this both ways, is we had a rental that says, I have 15 people at a pavilion, and then all of a sudden has 200. So if they say they have 200, I'm gonna need an extra easy up and such. We can now, when we're getting good information, now we can say, look, yes, you can or no, you can't and make those decisions upon the reservation. So I think the way this reads, it's literally when you're doing reservations opposed to somebody just pulling out a chair watching. Is that question already on the reservation form? Karen? We can, do you question? want, I mean, do you ask the people when they're making up, if they're renting a pavilion or something, does it actually say, do you want to bring some extra pop-up tents or, or um, a couple extra tables or chairs? And that's, that's not even mentioned, is it? No, not specifically, but we'll ask them. They'll ask, generally they'll ask if they've seen the particular well, well, I pavilion. know, but the people won't. They'll unless want to a, unless bring the person an extra knows. table, they'll want to bring an extra table for maybe food or something, and we'll say, no problem. Yeah, so, but what I'm saying is the average person on the street will not know anything about this. They can, won't even think to ask the question, can I can, bring an extra table or a couple of chairs? We can put that as part of the, to, to remedy that, we can put that as part, of the, as part of the application process. So we can add tables, chairs, whatever, to an application process to see if that's something that they wanted or needed, so that becomes Well, you can just state process. that on there. You can just say, that's you can I'm bring, we can you can bring a few extra, just say the word few, tables and, and stuff, and that's the end of it. Might, Go it ahead. could be a process-related question. Do you plan to bring any extra tables and chairs, yes or no? And yeah, yes. whatever. Okay. 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 Thank so you. Are we good? Good on that one. Next, what's your next one? Uh, same page. Um, and, and Karen, <laughs> you, you can laugh on this one. You can help me out. But if I look at J item 2 down there, II, says full payment is due 30 days prior to the use date. Then if I go down to the very bottom line where it says payments, personal checks will be accepted 10 days prior to the event of program. Well, if full payment is due 30 days in advance, and here you're taking checks 10 days, uh, the wording, so, again, I'm just I'm so confused. So part of this is we don't take personal checks under 10 days. Under 10 days, you can still get it, but you have to do credit card payment because if you have a check that bounces, we now don't, it usually takes more than 10 I'm days. I'm not so questioning, can, Mary, no, I'm not questioning what we're, no, why I, we're doing that. But to me, it, it's, it, it, if the, the, the J up on top, it says J-I-I, full payment is due 30 days to advance. Well, that, that, does, that doesn't make any sense because down below you're saying you're still taking checks 10 days later. I mean, up to 10 days in advance. You, and I understand. personal checks though, right? Personal checks. I understand what we're doing, that is but correct. I'm saying somehow or another the wording doesn't, it should all be internally consistent, right? To me, that's not internally consistent. You're not gonna, it's not going to be internally consistent. If, we, if, if you come in 10 days in advance and you want to rent, I will take your rental, but I will not take a personal check. And so this is, per, this is saying, and we can reword that, but no personal checks will be accepted 10 days prior to an event. You can still rent. I'm just not, we're just not accepting as a district a personal check. Okay, so then maybe the way to do that is to change the wording up there. It could be for, for, for those events. Yeah, for, gen, for those events that have been booked more than 30 days in advance, the final payment is due, you know, 30 days prior. That's all. I'm just trying to make it internally consistent. That's a very minor thing. And then um, the same page, K, where it says faci facility refunds, and it talks about deposits and 
Um, I assume it's the same issue you said. Before. Yeah, it's the same. I'm not sure if that's exactly the same one, but it's related to the same issue about so, yeah, cancellations okay. made through the district office no later than 30 days prior. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, this page doesn't talk about trash pickup, correct? I don't see anything on the. Okay, I'll bring that up here. Come uh, up. That actually was covered under J9 IIX to cover the cost of dumpsters. Oh, there it is. There we go. Okay, so if, a, if an organization brings in their own portable toilets, you're not talking about that. You're talking about if the district has to provide those. Exactly. Okay. And I have, and this is going to come up again later on, but let me just bring up an item about trash pickup and stuff. If um, there's an activity going on, a pavilion or something, I've often seen it where the trash containers at the pavilion are full, and they're overflowing, and then the birds get into them. And I've seen birds and animals coming down and picking up trash after the people have left. I'm walking through the site, and I see trash laying around. Now, the people might have put the stuff in the container, but now the birds are picking it up. So now, are, are we saying our staff is going to be charging them for this? Because, because be careful when you answer, because oh, I, have I have people who have told me they've been charged. And Yes, I mean, if it's ex if it's really a dirty and messy, yes, we will charge. Oh, I, I, we know the birds will take a make a mess. See seagulls come in. We know all that. We know trash cans get full. If you know, we go by, we empty them. They at the end of the day, they put all their tablecloths in them. They get full. We we understand all that. That's not the issue. It's it's when there's excessive amount of trash, and we t we take pictures, and you know, I I totally get it. But when it's excessive. Um, we can't have that. We, okay, so we deposit a couple weeks ago on an incident because something happened. So, so you're, you're, there's an activity. It's over. The trash cans are full. I mean, I, I know at Pleasant Valley Fields, for example, there are our contractors leave at three or something, or right. three thirty, or two. Right. Two o'clock they leave. Okay, I don't, whatever. So they're gone at two. Well, some of those trash cans will start filling up after two o'clock. You know, before the activity is done. And there's no one, we don't have any staff out there often. I don't know if they do or not. I haven't seen that many times. Now, what happens if those trash cans get full? Now we've got some stuff laying around. If you have a got, my question is, if you have, if one of our staff people is walking around for half an hour, checking out the site, and they pick up one candy wrapper, is that going to count as a, a no. no? Okay. No, it's, it's the excessive abuse of the park. And excessive abuse means? When it, on rentals, mainly it's on rentals, on on what you're talking about with the ASO or some use of the PV fields, that, that'll be brought up later. Um, w right now we have two people on Saturdays at, at PV fields. This guy comes in at... Uh, well, well they're our contract six, staff, and then, Yes, right? and, then he, and then we have another guy come in. So we have two staff members on, sa at, on Saturdays. Okay. Okay. So the other, just to kind of go over this again, is so... And I'll, I'll use picnics. I'll use whatever, you know, whatever we want to look at, but... So with a pavilion and you're supposed to have 40 people and you have 60 or 80 people, you're going to have extra trash. And well, so I'm not even, I'm not talking about when they have, I'm just saying when they got 40 people show up and there's 40, but maybe other people came by and used that trash can before. Some Absolutely. people didn't so even, the, I've seen it where people have not been reserving pavilions and they're just coming in because no one's using it and they use it. Correct. Well, they're filling up the trash. Now the people who come in to reserve it are there. And the trash, is, trash so containers are already halfway full or all full before they even get a chance to use it. Are they going to be, you see what I'm talking about? It, it, we, sometimes we have that happen when the rangers have to come by and, and, and kick the person out that has no permit. Our staff call, is called by the ranger. We come back and clean it. Because <coughs> you did reserve it. It's under your name. You know, it, it happens or something, sometimes it, somebody shows up. So we do get back over there. We run a quick uh, cleanup. So, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure that a full trash can is a reasonable excuse to throw your trash on the ground. It's if you go if you go to the beach, there are not trash cans necessarily all over the place, and you're not expected to leave your trash all over the place. You go to a national park, you're not expected to leave your trash around. So maybe maybe we ought to be instructing people that ex excess trash needs to be. Needs to, they need to be trash bags along and carted out. It's a, um, I don't, 
I, 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 I like I that idea. I, I don't buy. Take I don't buy out. the idea that just because the trash can's full that that's an excuse for your. If you. I'm not asking for any justification on yeah. that. My my problem is you should be. We should be then targeting the individual who's leaving that trash. And if an organization, we just had girls baseball in here, softball in here. If girls softball is running a program at Mission Oaks Park, and. Well, if they're, if they're renting the facility, then our guys go by later and we find a couple things going by. We don't know if it was someone related to the girls' softball program who left those candies or someone walking their, their kids, uh, the dog, to the dog park or something. And there have been organizations that have been charged for trash pickup that maybe or may, may not have even been involved with what's going on. But that's where my issue is. If it's some common sense, if, okay. if we're talking about a couple little items, I'm not... That's, but, you know, the question is, where, where is that? So the other question that I'll have, and this becomes a budgetary item. We have staff that, go, that work, start at 6 o'clock in the morning to get all the pavilions, all the facilities, everything ready to go. They work eight-hour days, which means by 2.30 they're done. So then the budget item that we'll have to discuss is if... And this goes, it doesn't matter if it's a picnic, it doesn't matter if it's a youth sports org, it doesn't, it doesn't matter who it is, it's an eight hour day. So if we're going to start shifting that, then that becomes a budget item. And if the board's expectations then, which they very well could be, is if the expectation is, is that everything is clean and ready to go and that there's never any trash on the ground, then we're gonna have to hire more staff to be able, no, I know, but I'm just saying, then we're gonna have to be able to do that because at two o'clock, you're absolutely right. You've got youth sports that probably doesn't get done till four or five. There's no way that we're going to be able to open, clean, and come back at the end of the day to be able to do that with put, without putting more staff at it. And you're right, what will end up happening, and this has happened before, is then you have trash around and it doesn't get picked up till Monday or Tuesday, or I shouldn't say Tuesday, it doesn't get picked up till Monday. So that does become, that does become an issue. And so the question then becomes of what's obsessive, what's not obsessive, and what's, it, what's, what's good, what's not good. And I think this is where we kind of get this, where we go back and forth of this, of how do we control that. And I think that's, that's part of the challenge that and, we're And, and that I we're agree. And about. that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's Absolutely. that common sense. When I was a regional commissioner of ASO and we were out there at Freedom Park, I was myself and whoever was out there with me, at the end of every, every uh, Saturday, I would walk around the entire site picking up trash. That was... As a regional commissioner, that was one of my jobs, making sure I did my best job. Now, did I get every little piece? Did I walk every foot? No. I mean, I might have missed some here or there. And I don't, what I'm saying is if an organization makes a good attempt, a fate, a fate, a good attempt at trying to pick up the trash and police what they're doing, and then staff comes by later and finds five candy wrappers spread out over 55 acres, they're not going to be charged for it. I mean, that's this. There's always going to be a little tiny minor amount that it's common sense that you really can't, you can't have someone check every square foot. I mean, you know, if they make a good attempt policy. Now, they're leaving a pile of trash, I agree. And people have done that. Maybe walk away and leave stuff. But that's not, my, that's not what I've seen from most of our organizations. Well, I, I don't Am know. Am I mistaken? It, I would say to some degree, yes. Because I have been out there. I have gone after after some of the community service groups, not all of them. I've seen tents, I've seen chairs left. So there is some of that stuff that happens. And then what happens is then on Sunday or Monday, then you know our staff, Brightview, whoever, now is now trying to play catch up and getting all that. Is it every day? No. Does it happen? Yes. Is it the norm? I wouldn't say it's the norm, but are those occasions out there? They are. So I think that's, that's what I'm saying. I think that if we want to have that discussion, that becomes a budgetary, it potentially becomes a budgetary item that we're going to need to look at and then kind of what expectations are and we can continue to have that discussion if that's helpful. Because to me, the, what we should, if it's a, one of our groups or something, then we need to work with that group to be self-policing you know, and stuff and see if we need more trash cans or whatever. Um, out there for the activity. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let me, I just have one anecdote, that one situation, and I'm not sure it impacts this argument one way or another, but I, what has happened, like for instance, Mike brought up PV Fields, is the groups have moved some of the games over to Sunday in order to alleviate traffic 
uh, in the parking lot and parking problems and so forth and parking around the area. So they've moved a, a lot of their games to Sunday. The problem is on Sunday we only have one guy there and he leaves at 2 o'clock. But the games will go to 4 or 5 o'clock. And so on one hand, they're, they're trying to help out and then they get punished if there's trash out there because the guy's gone at 2 o'clock and they have moved people over in order to accommodate uh, not only the, the Wreck and Park District, but the citizens of, of Camarillo as well as their, you know, to, to cover the behinds of the, their own groups. Uh, and so, uh, and I'm sure that that may exist in other places also. So. Um, there's a there's a lot of layers to this uh, that need to be discussed when when we come up with a definitive policy regarding this particular subject, the trash. Yeah, and, and I would I would I would agree with you because I think one of the things um, which is unique at PV Fields is we have a contractor that does it all, and so with that contract, there's X amount of hours that they work and and such, and so we do get into we do get into issues of what those hours look like and how many hours a day. And you're absolutely right when you look at an eight-hour day, what that looks like and how we'll have to craft that and continue to craft that. Okay. Anything else, Mike? Um, let me see here. Um, um, at the top of page 8 of 17, this again goes back to facility cancellation if a reservation is canceled 61 or more days prior to the event I mean this goes back to that same topic again about days and and stuff um, and then you can see it repeated down below and um, and then where it says no refunds will be given for imp you know bad weather or whatever and I understand but if if they're I guess, and I'm assuming this is not written into here, but I'm, I'm assuming you already mentioned the common sense. If there, if there, if someone's renting uh, one of our rooms, or the, they're renting one of our indoor facilities, or something. There's a high wind outside, and at, you know the power companies, you know, shut off our electrical power, and they can't use the facility. That's due to the weather, but uh, you know, according to this, they're still going to end up paying for it. You see what I'm saying? I mean, technically. The wording here, if if they, you know, what I'm saying, it, it, I'm not sure if you can put. I, I I understand you would understand that, you know, you you, would, you and staff would re recognize that if the utility company turns off the power, they're not going to be charged for the rental because they had to be forced out of the room or something. But again, okay. Uh, that item hasn't been discussed because I don't think it'd been even a thing before. Well, ago, but so. it's it just. <laughs> It can be, I would say it can be brought back to the committee because it's a new, it's a new, we're in a brave new world. <laughs> um, okay. I'm hoping. Um, on page 10 of 17, athletic facilities, and in there you talk about a um, MOU and stuff. Do we actually define anywhere in here, or is it defined anywhere, if there's a conflict between this general use policy and the MOU, which one, do we actually say the MOU supersedes this? Is that listed somewhere? Or if you have a, you can, you can say, you can talk, Eric, I mean, you can. No, I thought we had put. So, I'm actually. You, you, see, you see what I'm talking about? Yep. I, I'm wondering General, if we have we have our ordin right. So ordinance eight is at, ordinance eight is the top. It doesn't matter what the MOU says because ordinance eight ordinance eight is the over overarching. Okay. So ordinance eight, whatever is in ordinance eight, that's what we have to have to follow. Which is why we're having discussions with ordinance eight. Um, from there, then it would be general use in the MOU. And I thought Anthony, I know we had this discussion in policy that we had put a section in there regarding the MOU, um, individual MOUs. So the individual MOUs are part of the community service organization section, but I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike, I'm looking through athletic facilities and I'm trying to find where it is you're referring to MOUs. Oh, I thought I, oh, well, maybe it comes up later, my mistake. Okay, well, I, I brought that up 
okay, it's probably going to, it comes up somewhere, but I forget where. But the question's still valid. My, my question is, if there's a policy in the general use statement policy here that we're looking at, and if it conflicts with what's written in the MOU, does the MOU then supersede this for that one specific example? So if you look on page 12 under community service organizations, if that's what you're looking for. Oh, I think it's, yeah, it's probably worth it. Okay. So if you look at the second sentence, approve, so this has to be approved community service organizations shall enter into a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with the district, which shall govern the organization's re relationship with the district. So, Mary, where are you reading that? So at the bottom, sorry, on community page service. Page 12 organ, of 17. Page 12 of 17. In the middle of that last paragraph. So in order to receive the benefits afforded by this classification, community service organizations shall submit on an annual basis an organization file to be approved by the district board of directors, which shall include a report of on organizations, business, and financial conditions. So if you remember about a year and a half ago, the board approved what the MOU and the stuff that would be in it. So that means that all the organizations are required to, to get all that documentation. And so that means that that's that, not my, but that's right, not my but question. That, right. But what I'm saying is, is what this document says is that the MOUs would override. What they can't override is the ordinance. So the ordinance is first. If there's something conflicting in here, then the MOU as stated would supersede. Okay. Thank you. And, and as far as I understand, this section under athletic facilities is written in, in, Pretty well in concert with the existing operation of our community service organizations so it should mesh pretty well okay and then on that same page 12 of 17 um, uh, uh, right up above that it says uh, for uh, class 2 rental rates are only available Sunday through Thursday. And so obviously not Friday and Saturday. Is that because Friday, Saturday is our high public use? Yes. So that's, and that's been a long-term policy, I guess? That's been in existence since at least 2015. Okay. <coughs> and then the last, and this is just a fun one for... <laughs> For Anthony or somebody, if uh, the last page, 17 of 17, if you go down to that list and there's I and then there's II, what's the difference between all sport organizations and sport leagues that are using district facilities? I would assume that all sport organizations are also sport leagues. Is that true or am I, this is a minor issue. I mean, you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to see the difference between the two. So I think this required it. So that's actually, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, but I do believe the intention of this uh, here uh, was essentially, let's say, for example, the difference between a community service organization, sport league such as ASO, and an organization outside of that such as Manka. So what but, but, but when you say all sport organizations, that would include ASO or Eagles or girls softball, wouldn't it? Am I confused? Or should, do we need to define that or something? So sports league. So there's two different things. When I'm looking at sports leagues, so those are. So if you set up a league, ASO, Eagles, all of those that have sports leagues, all sports organizations mean that if there's anything that's organized. So if it look, let's say lacrosse, any of those would be required to have insurance. So according to our insurance, anything that would be considered any type of sports organization would have to have would have to have insurance if they're going to use any of our fields or such. So we Again, can, I'm not questioning the policy. No, I'm just trying to question the wording because it sounds to me, if you just say all sport organizations, that it would include the sport leagues. We can am I mistaken? A, no, we can do that if you... I mean, just help. Am I mis is there something I'm missing? I don't nope, see we can do it. how it makes a difference. So Everybody has to have insurance. Anything that's organized. Yeah. So, I mean, we can, we can just put all sports organization and leagues and drop okay, the Okay, whatever. That's just a minor thing. That's all I had. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm sorry, but sorry to say, but I have some. <laughs> he apologizes in advance. <laughs> um, I just, I have uh, just two quick, quick things. One, one is that I, I can't believe Director Mishler missed this one, but uh, back, <laughs> back on page 12 under community service organizations, um, there's a sentence there that, that. Uh, 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's the the wrong page. I'm at page ten under athletic facilities. On th third line down, starts with an adult over 18 years. I can't make sense of what that sentence even says. So it's, <laughs> it's uh, it looks like it needs to be rewritten. There was some internal discussion on this one too. So I'll, let me read this out loud. An adult <laughs> over the age of 18, however, when Alex, that's that's exactly the part right there. That's the part that were that was under uh, under discussion. There was um, language that was recommended by the attorney to be included. I think it's an error. It's supposed to match Ordinance 8 in regards to uh, the um, the alcohol reservation portion. So that first that first portion of that sentence, the an adult over the age of 18, however, when alcohol is present, an application must be signed by an adult 8, 21 years or older, must sign out all applications and be responsible for said for said use. So. It's confusing, I know. T technically, if you take each element of the sentence, it works, but it can, be re it can be rewritten. It essentially just means that if you're 18 years old, you can sign an application, but if there's alcohol, you have to be 21. Okay. I think you need a comma after present, and you need an and between older and must. Does that work? I, it, it's, I think we might need to just take this to, to work it a little bit more <laughs> rather than figure it out. Here in two sentences would make it a lot cleaner. Yeah. We can do that. <laughs> or that. I, I like two sentences. <laughs> I like Anthony, long, when you explained sentences. it in two sentences, it was very clear, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm just telling you that came from the attorney, so I can't, yeah, I can't well, tell you what was going well, through their heads. Well, that's why they have all those parentheticals, because you can always <laughs> twist them around later. Yeah. Attorneys write sentences, but the t by the time you get to the end, you for forgot what the beginning was about. <laughs> so, but the last, the the other, the only other question I have is under under page twelve, community service organizations. Um, do we have a, um, a a policy or or a procedure by which someone who would who would desire to become a community service organization applies? No, there is no. Established policy. Should we have one? I would defer to the board. No. Any further discussion? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, let, let me I, just give you th some reasoning behind it. Community service groups, sir, as, as, as it says in the document, fills a need from the district. When the district has something that they want to support but does not have the manpower uh, or the uh, financial ability or uh, some other reason, uh, looks for a group that they can make a service group and they then perform that function. It's never been something where you come in and get an application and sign up for it. It's never been that. When we have a need, we fill that need by making a community service group. That's the way it's always been ever since I've been here. Well, we've had this discussion before that, that, that community service organizations, it's not just a matter of applying. There has to be a need for it. And the, certainly someone can come in and say, I would like to be a community service organization, and we could say we have no need for that. But that are, are, we, are we saying by, by no that, that we've decided that we have all those community service organizations we need and we're never going to need any more? or that, the, that it is the board's job to go out and identify that we have a need and go out and search for a community service organization? Or it just, just seems to me to, that, that the answer no is not really satisfactory. That's what's always happened. Which? which? That the board has decided what the needs of the, of the district are, and then we've sought out uh, such thing. Now, that doesn't mean somebody can't call a board member or uh, uh, make a campaign to try to become a, a service group, yeah. but we have never allowed that to be the indicator of whether we have one or not. It always was because we had a need to fill. Okay. So, so the board is pretty much in agreement that, that it's, it's really the board's determination whether we need something and it would proceed from there that's how I feel the, the rest I of think the board so Neil. I think the issue is themselves. also you have to look at our facilities for example if a group came in and and they they're um, a shooting club they 
you know, they got high powerful rifles and they want to have a shooting. Club. Well, we don't have any facilities. We don't no. have any money. Yeah. I'm not advocating for anything range. specific. I'm so just the, saying how, well, how I'm we, just saying we don't have yeah. a shooting range in the city yeah. or within our district. I mean, that's a valid issue. They would have to go out of the district. But we don't have any facilities or money to build one of those things. So we can't meet their needs. So we would say, well, thank you, but no, thank you. We can't, we can't handle that. I mean, that's not right. That'd be a board decision. Now, maybe the board says, oh, yeah, having a rifle range is great, and we want to do that. But, but the point is, we don't, you know, we have to. So it's what the community needs balanced against what the resources are from the board. Well, that's, 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 I fully understand that. That's not really the question. It's, uh, the question is, is how do we get to, how did we get to, how do we go on into the future? Certainly there may be sports out there that will come along that we've never even heard of today. And, and if, how, does that, how does that organization ever beca become a community service organization? That's, that's truly just my question. And is it, is, uh, and I'm perfectly willing to accept an answer, but but I think there has to be an answer. The answer has to be that 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 we didn't that we decide that we need something, or that we don't really have a policy. It's just that someone comes forward and says, "I would like to be a community service organization," and we ask them to, to make a pitch, and we and we have really no no rules to go by. We just decide whether we think it's a good idea or not. Again, the issue is not whether they want to become a community service group. The issue is whether the district has a need for for that. That's the question: is how is that is how how is that process determined? That's really what I'm asking. Well, I would say it's worked okay up until now. Usually, what happens is somebody comes in and wants to compete with one of our service groups that has been in existence already. That's usually what happens. We rarely. The, I think the dog uh, group was the last one that made. Uh, and they, what did they do? They went out, they got all kinds of people, they proved up the need that, that we needed to support that. And so we did. Okay, so and then at that time, the board adopted yeah. that or ratified yeah. that. Yeah. And we, it, we then believed that we had this need. And what did we do? We came up with a service group for that particular item. That's how we did it. So anybody can do that. Nobody, yeah. Is, yeah. nobody is precluded from doing that. Yeah. But it's not a situation where you come in, you, sign an, you fill out an application, and then you come to a board meeting and argue that you deserve to be a service group because somebody else in the city already is it, and you deserve to have what they have. Okay. Yeah. My, my issue, again, was not, not that I'm trying to question the present the groups that we have or try to encourage someone to come in and look look to replicate what we already have i'm i'm just asking for question, questions about potential potential groups that may be worthy of being considered a community service organization that may be providing a service that we are not currently meeting and you can easily imagine what some of those might be and, and I'm not suggesting that we need another baseball team where, or, or another softball team, uh, but but there are sports out sports out there or other activities out there that might that might be organ, want to become organized well enough that they may want to be considered. And I'm just wondering what that process is who's for somebody who wanted to do that. Do that, and if, and if the answer is we don't have a process, that that uh, someone just has to come to us and present their case and. And we deliberate and make a decision. Then maybe that's maybe that is our process. But that's that's really my question: is 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 that how we do it, um, or is the or is or is the uh, or is the door closed? Or if we have as many as we need. We're not going to have any more. Or just you know that's well. Let's, let's use an example like lacrosse or something. You know, field hockey or lacrosse or something, and they want to come in and do it. They, they would make a presentation to the board, and we would have to decide. I mean, but it also balance. There's different issues going on. You know, it's like, you know, do we have certain you know, facilities to help? I them? understand all those questions. Yeah, I'm, yeah, but I'm, all I'm those, not saying, those I'm are all the things. We, but yeah. we would be discussing that as a board. We're not saying you can't come in and not okay. not talk to us. Okay. All right. I mean, it's okay. I mean, that's that's reasonable. That, that but I think that just this has to. I just, I just wonder how what our definition of how how someone gets there. So we don't really have a written policy then that it's someone deserve, thinks that they should be a community service organization, they can come pitch their case to us. Or if we identify a need, we can go out and search for someone to pitch it to. So is or, or they can convince the board that it's a need we need to fill. Well, in the past, what's worked well is that 
an, a, a group of citizens with a special interest organizes. In the case of the dog parks, it was the, to, to get a dog park in Camarillo. You know, there was a lot of resistance to the neighbors of the original place proposed, so a group of people supported it. They, they formed an organization. Um, I'd like to see an organization for lawn bowling because, you know, lawn bowling's come up in terms of the new facilities we want, but there's no organization in Camarillo to support that and to sort of champion it and say, you know, here's what we'll do and here's what, because what, what happens a lot with us is people come to us and say, oh, I'd like this or that. And we go, cool, what are you going to do? And their answer is, oh, I want you to do it. I'm not going to do anything. I just want to have this thing. And, and we typically say, good luck. See you on down the road. Or we find where there's proven community interest, like there was with the dog park, where there's a lot of people who want to do it. Like, okay, we're going to support this. And we work with them and we find a place and how it's going to do and how it's going to fund it and how they're going to support it. And, you know, that's essentially what it is. Because our core business here is supporting volunteer groups. You know, we're, uh, you know, they just repaved the roads at Camaro Springs. And um, I, I was super impressed by how organized and the whole thing was they ground the old pavement and they come in and put in the new and today they put the plastic down for the lines and the thing just looks absolutely like a brand new street. It's just, and nobody from the city ever touched it because they just hired a contractor and did it. We, we do some of that, but the vast majority of what we do is work with Pony Baseball and AYSO to enable them to do what it is they do. And you know, that's why I was so excited about the, the gentleman for girls softball tonight coming because he's got really ambitious plans to expand and everything and that's why there were so many questions about it because like they're doubling all these different areas and you know that's exciting but there has to be there has to be some demonstrated interest before it really it's a partnership yeah. sure I mean that, that, that's all very understandable that and someone and someone would certainly have to demonstrate all that before they would be considered but yeah. I just I guess it, it it appears though that it's a little ill-defined, though, uh, and I, if we want to leave it that way, then then uh, that's, that's uh, the board's will, and that's our will. But but uh, just wanted wanted to be clear that that there is a process, or or there is not a process, or the process is not defined. But but this, the door is still open. If someone was able to demonstrate that they, just demonstrate that they had an organization that was willing to support something and and uh, provide volunteers and do all the things that we described that, that we like a community service organization to do then I, I think that we have to be open to considering that. We're not looking to duplicate what we already have. I'm looking to, I'm just considering the things that we don't have. And we don't have everything. And we can't have everything, but, but uh, this process of having community service organizations I think is a, is a good thing in a lot of ways in that it inspires people to, to if you really want something, then you, then you have to be organized and bring, and bring support for it. But we have to be open to be con to considering that, and it sounds to me like it's just a just kind of an ill-defined process. Is all. The, the more we talk about this, I think the more I'm thinking that we actually disagree. Uh, we agree on this. Uh, nobody's trying to keep any group that is needed by the, this district to perform a function that a lot of the people in the district want. No, nobody's not for that. Especially a group uh, that's willing to be a part of making it work. Yeah. Um, I, I can just give you an example. When the uh, people that were in support of the dog park first came here, I, everybody I think probably knows it, including them, I wasn't too keen on it at first because... You're giving yourself too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, and what, what, what happened was they convinced me. They changed my mind on it. They sent me emails, all, uh, some of them not so nice, um, some of them very nice. They, you know, got me in the grocery store and they talked to me whenever they could. They came to the meetings and voiced their opinions and uh, they knew exactly uh, where I was coming from, but that did not deter them. They continued to work on me and work on me until they actually got me to change my mind. Well, what I knew from that was these people are all in. I knew they were the kind of people, kind of organization that would be there and not cause the district to have to pick up all the load. And 
that is proven true. And so I'm glad they changed my mind. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about. If, if, you, if you want to be a community service group, you got to step up to the plate. That's really what I'm talking about. That's all I have. So are we going to table this and send it back to the committee and it'll come back? Okay. We don't need a vote on that. We're just making it. We are in agreement. We'll bring it back. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda. And thank you, Anthony, for being up there. That's a hard one to go through. What was that? I'm just thanking Anthony for standing up there and taking all the talk and everything. Yes, thank you, Anthony. Um, do we get some direction on that? Yes. Okay. Uh, D, consideration approval of persons and installation of 18 LED lights at the Springfield Tennis Courts. Good evening, Chairman Kelly and Board of Directors. I'm here tonight to request approval for purchase for 18 LED lights at Springville Tennis Courts. Uh, the Board approved capital project budget in the amount of 22000 to replace the metal halide lamps with more efficient LED lights at Springville Tennis Court lights. Uh, Springville is a five-acre park. It was developed in 1997. Uh, it's gone through a number of, of changes most notably improvements to the, the dog park. Um, Springville has three lighted tennis courts with six lights each. Uh, currently each uh, court, or I'm sorry, t t yeah. currently the lights are um, equipped with 18 1,000 watt metal halide lamps. Um, staff, staff is continuously servicing these lights, uh, whether it be changing lamps, ballast, uh, cleaning lenses, things like that. Uh, here's a picture of our, our current lamps. They were installed with the park in 97, so they're about 22 years old. Uh, staff has looked at a number of ways to reduce energy and maintenance costs throughout the parks. Uh, staff looked at um, Springville as a starting point. It'd be easier to isolate just the tennis court lights just to track the, the savings. Uh, the replacement of the metal highlight lamps with the LED lights uh, would reduce maintenance costs and energy costs. Um, metal halide lamps uh, over time begin to lose um, effectiveness, essentially burning full wattage, only receiving uh, half the, the light. Um, essentially, we're getting 50% of the light with 100% of the cost. <clears throat> it would also reduce maintenance costs, again, not changing ballasts or um, changing lamps on a normal basis. That was the last slide. <clears throat> uh, metal highlight lamps are once industry standard. Um, all four related uh, tennis courts have 1,000 are equipped with uh, 1,000 watt metal highlight lamps. <clears throat> In perfect condition, metal highlight lamps typically have a lifespan of about 1,000 hours. Uh, this is affected by weather, temperature, uh, moisture being turned on and off on a daily basis. <clears throat> Uh, metal highlight lamps, again, lose effectiveness shortly after being powered on. Um, they can lose 50% of their power as, as little as 5,000 hours. Um, again, they also have a um, high cost of operation over time. Lamps cost on an average about $35 per lamp every time we're changing one out, and ballasts are about $250, and it's uh, a timely uh, process to change those out. LEDs, on the other hand, have a rated lifespan from 70 to 100,000 hours. Uh, it's estimated that LED lighting will result in a 60 to 70 percent uh, savings in, in energy savings. Uh, this is due to getting the same efficiency from the light from about 400 watts compared to 1,000 watts. Um, once they're, they're installed, again, you don't have to replace the ballast or the lamps. Um, once they're in, you're, they're essentially maintenance-free for the life of the, the lamp. Uh, here's a comparison on top. You'll see uh, a thousand, or a thousand watt metal halide lamps, and on the bottom you'll see the uh, LED replacements. You can see there's not really any um, any dead zone here on the the LEDs. You get a better coverage. <clears throat> so staff solicited multiple bids. We received three bids for uh, lamps, uh, or I'm sorry, the LED replacements. Uh, Bright Court Sports Lighting came in right in the middle of the three. Um, the selection of Bright Court had a couple other factors besides just price. Uh, they, they were the only ones that offered adjustable lights, so we could um, 
adjust those, get better coverage of our courts. Uh, they were also, these ones are able to connect right to our current light poles without any added um, mounting hardware or mounting brackets. So attached right to what we have. Uh, the, these lights also had a 10 year warranty compared to a five year warranty of the other companies. And they came highly recommended with several uh, recommendation letters. Uh, here's a breakdown of the three different bids. Evergreen Applied, applied Technologies, Bright Court Sports Lighting, and FSG Lighting. Uh, Bright Court came in uh, the middle <coughs> bid between these. Uh, here's an image of what the new, lamps will, new lights will look like. Um, here they'll attach to our existing uh, uh, post, and there's the adjustable knuckle that's on the, the lamps. <clears throat> so $22,000 was allocated for this project from the capital projects budget. Um, Brightcore came in at 16,300, uh, with 5,600 left over. Uh, those additional or those residual funds will be set aside for additional installation material like <coughs> wire nuts, wiring, any um, nuts and bolt things like that. Um, we don't see the need for any rental equipment needed for this project. We can use our lifts that we have in house. <coughs> so it's recommended to the board of directors, authorized general manager to enter into an agreement with Bright Court Sports Lighting for the purchase of 18 LED tennis court lights to replace the current 1,000 watt metal halide lighting at Springville Tennis Courts. Any discussion? Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the little product spec sheet on the actual light fixture itself, <clears throat> and I, approve, I assume that those individual little units are replaceable, so it's not like when the unit goes bad, they have to put a whole new unit the in. The entire thing is, is sealed, so the... the oh, it is sealed? Right. Okay. So, so once, once they're installed, that <coughs> you leave them and you don't install them, or you okay. don't replace them until they completely fail. Okay. So if they fail in the first 10 years, they come in, out and put a whole new unit? Correct. Okay. Because right, I saw in the list here, it shows different optic types for different models, so I thought maybe they're replaceable. But okay. That, that makes it pretty simple. Right. Yeah. We put them in, they run for 10 years. Correct. Okay. Hopefully longer. It looks like from the pictures that the light cutoff is pretty sharp, too. Uh, you know, the, the light stays where you want it to be. Oh, There's right. Yeah, they have a lot better optics than mm -hmm. the metal highway lights have. Yeah. Now, um, what is the parking lot light situation out there? Do we have the old style lights in those? <laughs> yeah, those are Because I assume the 16 are going to cover the two courts. And oh, correct. They're um, covering the three courts. They each have 16. Um, lights, I think they're still, they're either 250 watt or 150 watt that are in the parking lot there. Okay, so they're the old style stuff. I'm sorry? They're the old style stuff? Correct. Or, okay. All right. That's all I had. Was there a reason we didn't talk about the, the parking lot? Um, we were looking at some other options on a separate project with that. Okay. Anything, Doc? Yeah. Is there, is there, uh, do you have any projections at all as, in terms of what the savings are in terms of electricity? So based on um, last year's costs for that park, because there's not a whole lot of other electricity there besides um, the waterfall and a couple of lights, um, our costs were $4,600. So at a 60% savings, which is estimated, uh, our savings will be about 2700 or 20, 20, I'm sorry, 2800 um, So our costs next year, uh, this is based off last year's cost. Um, our estimated cost for next year would be in the round of 1900 so about 2800 a, a year. So likely in, the, in its 10-year lifespan, it more than pays for itself. Uh, based on the, uh, the 22000 amount, it would pay for itself in slightly under eight years. Um, that's just for energy savings, not to mention yeah. the maintenance costs. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. And, and our staff can put them up? Yes. And that, yeah, we'll, that we'll, won't... Uh, Void the the warranty. No. Okay. My question is, what happens? And I'm, if a tennis ball hits one of those brackets, it, you, I haven't seen one. It, are they pretty <laughs> rugged? I mean, are they designed to take a hit from a tennis ball or something? They are. They're they're designed for tennis courts, and that's one of the uh, benefits about the uh, bright court as well. Is they're designed <coughs> specifically for the, um, tennis courts, so they're a little more rugged and. They're they're built for that durability. Okay, so but even if even if a tennis ball does hit it, and something happens, we still have a ten year warranty on them anyway. So okay, thank you. Mike just asked the question, and I wanted one of the two questions. Um, 
The metal uh, halide lights, I have friends who have shops that have those inside their shops, and they've had them in there for years, and I haven't noticed the degradation of the lighting in their shops over the years. Now, it's maybe that those lights are different, more powerful, or what have you. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure what they have in there, but being that they're, they're not in the elements, um, I don't know how often they're turned off and on by people that are playing on them. Ah. They're, they're not in rain. Um, the metal highway lights take, so if you, turn, if you turn them off and then turn them back on, they could take 15 minutes to, yeah. to get um, back to full light. So I think there's quite a few factors that play into it. Thank you. Um, I'll make a motion to approve and authorize the general manager to enter into an agreement with Bright Court Sports Lighting for the purchase of 18 LED tennis court lights to replace the current um, 1,000 watt uh, metal halogen um, lighting at Springville tennis courts. I'll second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Mishler? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Dixon? Aye. Chairman Kelly? Aye. This one shouldn't take too long. E, consideration approval of request for proposal for a grant writer. Good evening, Chairman Kelly, members of the board. So what I've got before you is consideration and approval of looking at um, identifying and selecting an experienced professional grant writer. Um, so one of the discussions we've had is, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is we've been looking to figure out different ways for bringing in revenue, and one of those would be to, to uh, look at grants. So in that, the district uh, continues to examine multiple sources of funding, um, especially for the senior slash community <coughs> recreation facility. Um, the board, as part of the budget process, approved $10,000 for a, for a grant writer. Um, and so the, the whole purpose of that was specifically to look at that, to look at potentially federal, state, and private grants. Uh, so at the September 16th meeting, uh, the joint meeting, um, both the board as well as city council approved option D, which now means that they can go out, if we hire a grant writer, can go out specifically look, specific what this looks like and, and, and look for grants. So the grant writer will be utilized to assist with the preparation of the proposals. The primary responsibility will be to provide and look at opportunities, as I stated, both federal, state, and private foundations. And a lot of times looking for those grants takes time and effort. Um, when we get Prop 68 and some of those, it's easy for staff to identify, but there's a lot of other things and a lot of other grants out there that take a lot more research. So part of the request for proposal is to review uh, for the grant writer and what we're looking for is somebody that will be able to review what our organization looks like, documents, so they have a good idea what we're looking for, is knowledgeable about potential community resources, <coughs> collaborations, other partnerships that, that may be out there. Um, grant writing is kind of a niche and so a lot of grant writers have ideas already of what, what other things are out there. Um, conduct research, foundations, look at corporations, make sure whatever we're applying for, their mission matches what we are. Um, because a lot of times I can apply for grants and if they don't coincide of what our mission looks like, what we're trying to do, then that grant <coughs> isn't going to be successful. So they'll also be responsible for con conducting a full range of activities from preparing, submitting, and managing the grant proposal along with uh, staff assistance. Um, other things, they'll be assisting with setup of hopefully record keeping, reporting, any of those kinds of things that would be a part of that and providing ongoing consulting, coaching during the implement implementation process of that and managing and updating project funding and, and a, a needs list. So the other thing that even though our main idea and main goal is to find funding for the senior and community center, if there was another grant out there for something else, they'd be able to pass that off to us as well if there was something for a park or some other opportunity that would meet the needs that we have. So at this time, there's no fiscal impact associated with this action item as really what we're here tonight is it's recommend the board of directors approve the request for proposal for a grant writer selection process. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board has reg regarding that item. Um, Mary, the 
And I'm glad that the person can, uh, my first question was just to confirm that the, the potential grant writer could go out and ask for, we're focusing on senior center, community right. center activities, but if something comes up with an open space or something else, and this will let you know, I see mm. there's the Santa Monica Mountains Conservatory has a lot of grant money they put out every year, and uh, this lets you know that. I mean, they, there's a lot of stuff going on. That's one that I, one of the things that should be in the mix we can look at down the road. Absolutely. For open space or doing, you know, acquiring or doing something. But anyway, my main question is, it looks like you're trying to get the, um, uh, the proposals back by November 1st. And this goes back to what, something that Mark always asks. Is that really enough time to get the advertising and, and, and give them time to, to respond? I don't want to make it too rushed. I mean, I want to obviously go forward, but I don't want to make it, I want to make sure we have enough time so we get, we get qualified people in here who may be interested, not, you know, I'm yeah, just asking. We, we can ex Anthony? I was just going to say, actually, I just received a phone call um, yesterday from a uh, company that monitors for RFPs and RFQs, uh, specifically asking about this particular item. So it's already, it's already on people's radar, even though we hadn't even approved it yet. So well, I guess my, my main question is, is November 1st enough time, one month away, essentially, or a little bit less than that, really, to... to for people to respond who are really interested. I, I would absolutely say yes. In fact, just my own professional experience prior to working for the district, I used to be a grant writer, uh, and and four weeks is more than enough time to present a proposal for less than $10,000. Okay, thank you. Well, why aren't you doing the grants then? <laughs> <laughs> in, in your spare time. Yeah. I've been I have a question. Um, is, uh, is this, just to make clear to me, is this something where we are looking for an employee or are we looking to contract with an agency that, that provides uh, as an independent contracting sort of agency that would do this for us? It, it could be a combination of both. So when we were having this conversation, it could be an agency like Anthony's referring to. It could be an indep independent contractor that we're hiring. It wouldn't obviously be a staff member, but it would be somebody that we would hire to do this. So um, I know that I've got the list of or a name of at least one other grant writer now that I've been in contact um, as we've been having these conversations um, that actually uh, Dave Norman had referred over. So I know that we've got at least a couple different grant writers that have kind of been following this process. So it would be hiring either an ag agency and or an individual. So as, as an individual, would they, would they, because you're asking for $10,000, would that, would they be on our payroll then? And no, it'd that, be independent contractor. Okay. okay, that's my question. Okay, thank you. Um, grant writers are used to working on fast turnaround because that's typically how it works. You know, we saw that with uh, our Neil Ranch thing. <coughs> that's the nature of it. And um, we've had, over the years, a couple of grant writers speak to us at VCSDA meetings. Yes. And so there's, there's people out there that specialize in this. And once those words grant writer hit the internet, the, the, whole, the whole mechanism jumps into gear. So we'll, 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 get, we'll, get, we'll get plenty of response. Um, I will make a motion to approve the uh, request for proposals for the grant writer selection process. Second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Dixon? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Mishler? Aye. Chairman Kelly? Aye. Okay, item number 10. Uh, Mary, do you have the answer to that question I ask? Yes. <laughs> um, it would have been the Friday that we sent out the documents. So how far, how long before that Monday was it? It was the Friday before. So we just got those? Yes. I don't have anything. Um, B, Ventura County Special District Association. Okay. Um, last night, um, the general manager and Director Malloy and Director Mishler and I attended the uh, bi-monthly uh, 
Ventura County Special Districts Association um, meeting at the uh, Granson Pump Station. Um, we had uh, dinner in Pump Station 1 and toured Pump Station 2. And um, I, I never thought, I, I, I always laugh when Mike and, and uh, Mark go on these uh, water trips. And uh, I, learned, I learned so much last night from Tony. Tony's presentation was, was great. And to learn how we get our water and everything, and it's very, very, very interesting. So, uh, and it was nice to to tour the the two uh, pump stations. Uh, was very um, very nice. Um, you want me to go ahead with CSDA, sir? You want me to go ahead with CSDA? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, General Manager Otten and I attended the um, annual uh, CSDA conference and uh, exhibitors uh, showcase last week. It was the uh, 50th anniversary of uh, CSDA, and uh, one of the highlights was that one of the participants who had attended the first um, annual conference was also at attendance with uh, at this one and uh, we all know him as being Jack Curtis and he spent time with Mary and I and and it was a very enjoyable time uh, there was 850 uh, registrations uh, or registrants and uh, 75 exhibits uh, we uh, the breakout sessions were good the um, uh, two speakers they had were excellent. Um, they made some changes to the pro, uh, format that were uh, well received by everyone. And um, I have some ideas for food truck uh, things. So uh, we had a, they did the taste of the city and uh, they did use food trucks and they had the best band. Uh, it was just great and it was really a, they had over 50 silent auction items. Um, that they did silent auction and and it was just a very nice uh, thing. Uh, we also um, Mary and I went to uh, dinner with uh, our finance people, Brandis and Tallman, bond council. Ah, uh, whatever. She knows those people. <laughs> so we they took us out and um, we went to. Uh, Disney downtown or Disney Main Street or something and and uh, we had uh, and at another time I'll tell you something that happened so but uh, it was nice to see all the Halloween uh, 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 decorations so um, Ventura County will be meeting at um, in December again and we will be doing um, uh, at United Water and I'm going to have Mary give you a little more CSDA information. Do you have the statistics on the ledge, Mary? The the two, the 2019 20 legislative um, uh, session is closed. We have until the 13th of uh, October for the governor to sign some bills. Uh, there was 3,332 bills. Um, presented or uh, introduced this year and uh, CSDA uh, tracked uh, more than we've ever tracked before I think over 700 of them and uh, we got some that were uh, we supported and actually got signed we had some that um, we opposed and they were um, we got some amendments done on them, and I believe there are two sitting on his uh, desk right now that we are in opposition of. So uh, we should know here in the next week or so uh, what the status of those will be. So, um, and uh, this two-year cycle that they go on is is uh, murderous because if something didn't make it to his his desk this year, it can be. Rebrought up in January, so we could essentially see 600 bills next or 6,000 bills next year. So it's uh, it's a busy time for CSDA, and well worth our time to spending time with them. So 
And yes, I'm busy. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be there for another two weeks, so. That's all I have. See Ventura County Consolidated Oversight Board. Pass that down. And Karen, you, you and staff can have some, or Bob can pick that up. Some copies for you guys. <clears throat> yeah, so I attended the meeting last week for the Ventura County Consolidated uh, Oversight Board. And what I have here is one of our, um, this is the first time, I, I talked about this at the meeting last night, but, uh, but this is the first time we have a consolidated overview of all the different uh, redevelopment agencies, which are now called successor agencies in Ventura County. And um, if you go across the 2019 to 20 uh, bracket area, one of the items up there, well, you can see the number of properties held. So these are the number of properties that the successor agency still has. And this, for our interest, here in Camarillo, you, say, you, you see zero. That's because the city of Camarillo, like a lot of these locations, um, transferred the three remaining um, properties to themselves <laughs> out of the successor agency. And they did that before the oversight board was formed. And so that's, so when you see talk about the old um, courthouse or the old fire station and stuff going on, those are outside of the successor agency stuff. So they're not using, when, they, when they're hiring consultants and doing planning and doing any development, they cannot use any successor agency funds or monies from our um, taxes to do that. That has to be a 100% city effort, including all the staffing and everything. Um, just to give you a heads up. Uh, it's still tax money that they use. Yeah, it's city, but it's city money. It's not, no, it's not, it's no longer the school districts and our special districts and everybody else. What they used to do in the past was do stuff and use all the other agency funds to do that. Now, they, by transferring it to themselves, they, they have now, um, you know, told the state that only the city will, only city funds will be used for that. Okay. Now, um, uh, the city of Oxnard, just for fun, you can see they got seven remaining properties there on the list. Well, they transferred some, I think it was 28 properties over to the city uh, a year and a half ago or something. So, um, but anyway, but um, the next thing to look at is the admin budget. I'm sorry, Mike, can I interrupt? What? I'm sorry, what? Go ahead. Ask, what why did they transfer these things to themselves if it just meant transferring the cost of, onto their own backs? Well, because if they left them in the successor agency, redevelopment slash successor agency, then we, the oversight board, get to review what they're doing with them, and we would basically be telling them, why haven't you sold all these properties and redistributed the funds? So if they had a site they didn't want to sell, and then because once, once they keep it as a, in the successor agency, now we have... We're an independent body, and we get to just we have to back up what they're doing. And a lot of these guys understood that once it went to us, the, the Ventura County Oversight Board, not their own private one, they wouldn't be able to do those things. So they very quickly transferred all those things over to their own cities uh, to to make sure that they were out of our control or oversight. So okay. We immediately save money. Well, we're going to say yes. We save a little bit of money, but it's going to come. Up. But we're still stuck for the bonds. The good news is any, any cost the city is spending on those sites in terms of developing them or r maintaining them and staff and people related to those sites, they transfer to, transfer to themselves, that's all city costs. The bad news is if you go over to the very last column I added, last bond payment, there's a bunch of bonds, and that's the second column. There's, like Camarillo has five different bonds they had taken out, over taken out over time to buy all these properties with and do stuff with them. Well, those bond payments are still, we're still on the hook. So the successor agency here for Camarillo is still on the hook for paying off the bonds that were used to buy those properties. And when they transferred those properties to the city, it was a zero cost. They just got them for free. So they didn't pay off the bonds or anything when they did that. So if you look out there, under, if you look out there for Camarillo, it'll be January of 2041 
before the last bond payment is made. So, so they got the properties for free, but we're still on the hook, all the taxpayers are on the hook to making all the bond payments that originally paid for the cost of acquiring those sites. So the property, the property is transferred them to them and the mortgage was left behind. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then, um, so... They could sell those properties. No, they can't. Well, when they transfer them to themselves, the Department of Finance, who had... W there were a lot of severe restrictions when they did that. And, and one of those things was the fact that uh, they had to have a specific use and blah, blah, blah. And like the city of Camarillo said, it was going to be for public use and, blah, blah, and stuff. And so that restricts what they can do with it. They can't just go off and sell them or something. Um, if they did, they would have to come back I think they would come back to the successor agency or something. That's, that's what my question is. Yeah, they can't this yeah, they can't sell them and keep the proceeds. That's what I'm saying. But they could sell them and pay a, pay off the bond. No, no, they can't sell them at all. Not when at they all. transfer them to the city, the state of California said those are your properties and you said you're going to use them for public whatever. And so that's the only thing they can do with it. They can't do any now there's no timeline. There's no restriction like you got to do it within X amount of time. But they are, they, they can't this, um, you know, they can't uh, use it for, for some other use or sell them or give them to another agency or whatever. So there's very, very strict re, uh, controls over all that. Okay. So we're stuck forever, basically. Well, we're stuck making all the bond payments. Okay. And then if you could look under the admin budget, uh, what the state had done in the past is allow each one of these agencies to basically get, without question, $250,000 to cover your admin, as, you know, your staffing overhead costs. And you never, in the past, they never really looked at those things. They just, it's like it was a freebie. So all these cities used to get 250000 out of the successor agency each year to pay their staffing and do stuff on them. Well, now that's changed. And, and last year when we were looking at these things, we were not allowed to question up to 250000 So if they had a, a request for 250000 we couldn't we couldn't deny it or ask questions about it. That was like automatic. But now for the first, but you see here where it says yes in the next column, the Department of Finance even came back now, and they're starting to ask questions and specifics and details of why you're spending this money. And they have now told us for the first time a few months ago that now we can, we now have the right to ask for more documentation, and if we have enough evidence, we can refuse what they're requesting, even if it's... We under, being the oversight board. The oversight board, yes. As a tax identity thing uh, for the taxpayers and stuff. We have the right to protect the taxpayers' money and stuff. And so in that gray column, you can see what they're requesting. And, um, for example, the city of Fillmore... Some cities are doing great. I want to give credit to Santa Paula and Simi Valley. They're really working overtime to clear this thing up and get it out. And you can see their admin costs are very low. Um, if you go up to Fillmore, they're still asking for $250,000. And when you look, we started to get the detail. We started looking at the detail. They're, they're putting their city manager down for 16% of his time. It's allocated to doing nothing but working, in theory, on the successor agency. Well, that's... Anyway, so there's, we're starting to dig into those things. We're starting to find those things out. We've got to ask more questions and stuff. But... So there's some issues going on. And this is also the, all these cities were there talking with us. We were asking questions to all these cities in the audience. The meeting went on for three hours. And this was the first time these other cities saw what other cities were doing. So, for example, when Camarillo, which has, all they're doing is making bond payments and filling out reports. And they're still asking for $93,000 next year. I said, well, look down here at Simi Valley. They got five different bonds to pay off. And they're asking almost half what you're asking. You know, how, how come Simi Valley do it for half your cost? You know, so these cities are for the first time seeing what, what other cities are doing. And we're starting to ask questions when they're all there. So they're starting to get more pressure and starting to respond to that. Mike, mechanically, how does that work? It says 93.5 for their admin requested. Uh, where does that money actually, what account does that money come out of? It comes out of the successor agency. And that's what the county will end up giving them. 
they have to make, so that money will be added to what they need for the physical bond payments. That's so if you add up the physical bond payments, there's five so different this bonds. Is this is money that is in addition to the bond payment. Yes, that's what they're doing. For Camarillo, because they have no properties, that's just servicing those bond payments. I mean, that's a lot of money to service bond payments. So, um, but what's happening is, and you can see some of these cities uh, are getting their costs down low, and eventually we're going to be trying to, so we're looking at, so we're doing several things. We're, we're, we're looking at the remaining properties and, and seeing how fast they can sell them and get them off and then use that money to pay back the bonds or redistribute it to the different agencies. We're also looking at that admin budget and starting to question over how much money they're really spending and why they're spending that much. And, um, and we also want to make sure that if they do sell a property, that that money goes back to the bonds, if not to the distributors, you know, and they don't reuse it for something new and stuff. Um, but the, for that 93500 you know, it's mostly staff, staffing costs related. But what we're also working toward is, if you look down here at Ojai, they have zero properties, and you see that they're not asking for any admin, even though they're still paying bond payments. So that the, the, what we're driving these agencies to do is, if all they're doing is doing paperwork and paying bond payments, they don't need an admin. That's part of your business, guys. And so what we're doing is trying to drive these guys down to lower costs, but also get them and file what's called the last and final ROPS. And when they do that, then their admin costs will go down to zero for us. So we're trying to at least clean up that admin cost, which is like one one point six million across the county, and stuff. Anyway, I'm just showing you we're we're starting to be proactive. We're starting to get information. We're starting to do stuff, and just to give you an update of what's going on with that. So what is uh, our payment each year at the? Well, I don't know. I have to look that up. That wasn't. Okay, I thought you might know it. No, it, 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 uh, we're, you know we're paying. Roughly three to four hundred thousand dollars a year out of our property taxes goes to the successor agency. And so the public should know that when when we get our money, that immediately, well, I don't know if it's the same day or the next day or whatever, but well, the county withholds that money. At some point, they take that money from us, and we don't get it, and that's a big chunk right out of our small budget. Um, Mike, Mike, can I, does the does the uh, oversight board do they have any authority in terms of looking at any of these individual bonds and seeing whether or not any of them could be no all the, the bonds or? the bonds were 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 before, you know acquired years and years ago, and as an interesting follow up question, to say hypothetically the bonds today interest go down so low, oh why don't we refinance them? No, the Department of California Department of Finance says that's it. No more refinancing, no more. You can't do a new bond anyway, period. They won't allow any new bonds. They have to go through us, and that's not going to happen anyway. But So you're not going to get any new bonds. But even on the existing bonds, even if they can get a lower one, some guys will try to get a lower one or extend out the time period. The state of California said, nope, that's it. What you got is what you have, and you just got to pay them down as quick as possible. But there's, we can't do anything with those five existing ones. Yeah. Santa Monica. Um, so I attended that meeting last week also. And um, the, the, main, the main driving force for this meeting last month and the, the, f the few previous ones is basically most of the stuff is all related to fire issues. And um, they have various grants they're doing and stuff, talking about grant writing. They have acquired a bunch of grants to basically do weed clearing and tree pruning and, and cleaning up a lot of the open space lands for prevention of fires and stuff and protection of fire stuff. They have previous, this year they have also acquired brand new firefighting trucks and equipment and stuff. Um, but almost everything, they're, you know, they're, they're, one of the grants they got here and one of the things they're doing is they have a lot of old buildings up there in the mountains that were, they picked up when they picked up their properties and stuff and historical buildings. And so they're looking, they're spending um, almost a million dollars this next 12 months to see how they can protect those buildings from from ambers and fire and stuff. So they, you know, they can't, they're historical buildings and old buildings and stuff, but they're trying to see what can they do 
to, to make some modifications to the buildings to allow them to do a better job of withstanding fires as they go through the area, potentially, for example. So that's the main focus here recently is all those types of activities. And um, they have their firefighters, when they're not fighting any fires or something, they're out weed clearing, <laughs> basically, and stuff. And they can't use poison, just for everybody to know, they're not, they're not allowed to use poisons or anything anymore, so it's all manual labor stuff. And the city of Los Angeles will not allow them to use weed whackers with metal, you know, because it can cause sparks. So, which is funny because, uh, so they got to use the old, wire, you know, plastic weed weeders, you know, so it's, it's hard work, you know, and anyway, so they're out there doing this, and the funny part is this is the fire department doing the weed clearing in Los Angeles, and they still won't allow them to use metal um, uh, <laughs> weed whackers. It doesn't surprise stuff. me. Okay. Um, finance. Uh, finance, we did have a meeting, and uh, we're only two months into the fiscal year, so we were only at uh, like 7 17% of our expenditures and our revenues. Actually, our revenues are well below that because, as you know, our revenues are heavily weighted towards our property taxes, which we see at the end of December and the end of April. So there's no significant revenue there. Um, we do have some additional revenue this fiscal year that we haven't had in the past in the, in the form of reimbursement for fire damage. So we have, so we have some extra money there, but you know, it's all being committed to doing things to fix fire damage. So. Um, uh, relevant to what Mike said, if you look in your budget item 6960, we've budgeted 459000 for redevelopment and collection fees and expect to reimburse on that in our budget item 5600 of 100000 So we're roughly expecting to lose to redevelopment $350,000. And it fluctuates up and down through black magic that we can't quite get a gist of, so we try and budget conservatively for it. But it is, it is a significant cost to the district as it is all special districts. And I believe the spreadsheet you did for the Special District Association showed the annual loss is somewhere like $1.8 million I mean, it's to, to agencies all over the county, special districts. Well, it was more than that, yeah. yes. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a lot of money. Yeah. So it's, yeah, we're, we're participants even though we aren't really a part of it. Um, but overall, we're in great, sh we're in good shape financially, um, and we already have our have our final, our f almost final numbers for last year until the audits are ready. So that's all I have. Liaison. I think the last liaison committee, we were all there, so <laughs> I'm sure there's not a whole whole lot more to say about that. And we're trying to work on a date for the next one. Long range. Was there a meeting? Uh, Long-range planning did not meet, no. Personnel? Yeah, it was closed session, and so I can't report on it. Policy? Oh, Mary? Is there, oh yeah. Policy? We're working on it. I guess we're going to take it back and we'll work on it some more. Foundation? Um, Megan gave a wonderful report, so just don't forget the... Uh, Painting with the twist and the uh, the donut dash coming up. I could use a donut right now. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's all. Jim. Okay, a couple updates. Um, speaking of numbers, we have the audit taking place, the pre-audit next two weeks. So we'll be doing that. Um, we have, just as a reminder, on the 24th, we have a board workshop um, that we have coming up. I know we have long range planning coming up this month, finance, and so there's a bunch of personnel, so there'll be more reports for next month. A um, Couple updates regarding some of the parks, Cam Grove. Hopefully they're working on the equipment as we speak. So that hopefully will be ready to go and open on October 19th. Uh, Pitts Ranch, uh, right now the last touches, so there we've got put in sod, so when they had to remove and put everything in, so we've got an area that's being sodded, so giving that a little breather, that should be open the weekend of October 19th. Um, freedom right now, um, we've had to extend the 90-day cure period as we're having some issues out there. There's still some brown spots. 
Um, Nick, correct me if I'm wrong. They had there was an uh, they had a leak. One of the. And then just um, some other areas of concern. So I, I extended it for another month, and we'll reassess it at, at that time. So know that that's still that's still ongoing because we want to make sure that when we get that, that um, everything is good to go. Um, Mel Vincent, the bathroom should be delivered on October seventeenth. <laughs> Um, and then Valley Lindo, we're looking at about another couple weeks on that one. So they're moving forward with that. They ran into some issues when they were lining up the plumbing. So they're finishing that. Um, once that's done, then I think we've got the um, overhang a little bit left. So we're, we're finishing a bunch of those projects here about mid-October. Um, as a reminder, just in... Um, for October, as Megan had stated earlier, we have all kinds of uh, special events going on from Spooky Swim to Halloween to Halloween. Um, so all that information is on the website. Um, if you haven't seen, our Christmas parade theme is Cosmic Christmas, still working on getting a Grand Marshal for that. Got some stuff in the works on that, but just to put that out there. Um, as Director Magner had mentioned, um, legislation right now there's a couple bills one in particular that's really going to affect us as well as mill special districts more so probably recreation and park districts and that's ab5 ab5 is the independent contractors um, so sat in on um, a session with that and there was probably a good 20 30 people that sat in on that one specifically but Literally, the crux of that is what is an independent contractor with the bill that came through. And so some of the determining factors that they're looking at and how you determine is um, the easiest way I think somebody described it to me is you look at the difference between uh, somebody that may do your roof and maybe somebody that's an admin assistant. So a roofer you hire independently. They come in. They set their own schedule. You hire them for ver something very specific. It's a skill set. They do the job. You pay them. Um, with a lot of the independent contractors, or if you look at um, a, um, like an admin assistant, we're telling them what time to go to work, we're doing, you know, setting schedules, we're doing training, we're doing all of those things. So the problem we have sometimes with our independent contractors is right now, um, when you look at it, we do the marketing for them, we do the registration, we do those kinds of things, so those lines become blurred. So we'll be working with our attorneys to figure out what that looks like, how we can do some specific things. Um, this goes across the board. Uh, so we're asking for more clarification as well as most recreation and park districts. Um, somebody gave an example of a golf pro. So you have a golf pro that typically they're only at one facility. So now the question becomes, should they be an employee opposed to if you have um, maybe a contract instructor, let's say, that's doing um, equestrian that uses four different sites and travels back and forth. Do they have a business license? Do they have workers' comp? So there's a whole series of things that will come that will come with this. So a lot of our agreements that we have with our independent contractors as well as anybody that does any one-off one that we do as a district, so like maintenance, um, any of those things, those things can be come into question. So we'll be do delving into that a little bit more as well as reaching out to other agencies to see what they're doing and if there's some ways that we can kind of co coordinate around this. So that's going to be one of those bills that I think unintended consequences have come from where they initially started with that. So that one we're working on, we'll be working on diligently. The other one um, that has a little bit of effect on us, and there's a number of them, but one that just as we're going into fire season is AB 1124, which is employment safety. So one of the things that's coming out with any worker, any, anybody that works outdoors, and if there's wildfire or smoke, we have to be able to provide respirators if they're going to be outside. 
Um, so those are some things that you're starting to see with some of the bills that are coming through w related to wildfires, as well as some of the ones that I think uh, Director Mishler was talking about when you're talking about clearing, how far things need to be away. So you're st starting to see some of those bills come through now too. So those are a couple of the highlights of bills that potentially affect us one more so than the other. I know that last year when we had the wildfire, we were already giving masks to employees that were out there anyway, but they've just kind of made this now law that, that you need to and make sure we supply it. So. Mary, you're seeing rest, not just in the R19 masks, the actual respirators they have to have. The R91. R okay. Yeah. So. So, so it's not really a respirator then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, we should mention also, uh, can we, uh, that Mark and I attended a meeting last, for our special committee last week with the designer for the new potential park in Springville there, the very east edge or west side of the town. There's potential new development. And there's a potential buyer for that site who wants to build homes and stuff. And so we're getting into the specifics of a potential, uh, I, you know, how to lay out the, uh, he was saying like a five point 5.1 acre park, basically. So we're, we're starting that initial detail planning and, and discussions. <clears throat> World communications. What's it, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Oral communications. Oh, I said enough, I'm happy. Um, I'm going to speak for a second. Um, if someone's trying to get in touch with me, um, the next seven weeks I will be out of town. Um, I will either be on personal vacation or I will be in Sacramento. So um, I even changed a flight to get back from Sacramento to come to our meeting on the 24th. So um, I'll be spending uh, three weeks in Sacramento and I've got other meetings to go to, and I'm leaving on uh, Saturday morning for a personal vacation for a while, so I'll be out of touch. A um, couple of, you know, been a been a busy month. Um, last night's uh, tour of the Granson pump station was really interesting. I've, I've driven by that building for 20 years, and yeah. I figured it was like the place the CIA hid to to protect the Reagan Library. I never realized that there were these huge pumps inside of it. And um, it, it, it's really interesting because, you know, most of us, we just turn the tap and water comes out. We, we have no idea how complicated the infrastructure is. And that particular place is, is interesting for two reasons. One is that, including last night, they were actually pumping water into the ground because um, Cayuga's Water District, which is the one that gets the water from Metropolitan that comes from up in Northern California, um, they have a reservoir, Lake Bard, that keeps a lot of water. But unfortunately, when you put the water outdoors, it tends to evaporate. And the evaporation, the amount of water they lose to evaporation each year is really substantial. But underneath that area of Moore Park, there's a 50,000 acre foot aquifer, and they actually can pump water into it and none of it evaporates, and then suck it out later when they need it. And then they built a second pump station that allows them to pump the water back uphill should there ever be an interruption in service from the state water project due to earthquake or some other disaster, fire, or whatever. And so they have all of that built in as well as generators to run it should there be an emergency and they have no electricity, they can run it themselves. And all of that infrastructure is devoted for emergency use only. So very few people realize that the reliability of, of our water is as complicated as it is and as expensive it is because it's just in the background, nobody ever talks about it. It was like 70 million, I think, roughly around 70-ish million for all that. And that doesn't include the wells and stuff. That's yeah. just for the facility. Yeah, that's, that's just, just for the facility to move it because most of it goes downhill, but when, when, there, when, there's no, when there's no state water, Thousand Oaks is in trouble because they have no groundwater. So... They got to have so all of these agencies work with each other to make sure everything's being done. And of course, we're familiar because over at Springville, they've been working on a project for Crestview Water, Cayugas and Crestview, and they've been having half of our parking lot blocked at Springville Dog Park, which I'm happy to report is now done. So we got the other half of our parking lot back, and a really busy park. But it was really interesting, and it's really great to see that you know in the in the big picture. 
there's people that really understand the infrastructure needs and are are there doing it and ma making it making it work. Um, and uh, I was going to mention the the Springville Park. Um, we're we're looking to have a dog area at that park as well, potentially able to to be the the plan B when the Springville Dog Park has to be closed for renovations, which typically happens about once a year. It gets so run down, we got to take it out of service for a while. So we'll have enough space to do that there, as well as do some other things in that park. And that'll be right next to the freeway and support that whole, that whole area, which has very little park space. And now they're about to have a restroom in their only park. So um, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the most of what I did this month. That's all I have. Mark, will that have, um, are you guys looking at having a, a restroom at that new park? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Got nothing, nothing to add for tonight. Sometimes I do things against my better judgment, but I always do them anyway. Um, I've been thinking about that night that we had the meeting with the city regarding, um, the senior center and the gym, and um, I just I verified with Mary tonight uh, because I, I thought it was the case, but I just wanted to make sure uh, the report that contained the financial errors in it. We only got that on Friday, and the meeting was on Monday. Is that correct, Mary? Yeah, I believe the board packets went on Friday. We came to the meeting and basically got ambushed. And I can't tell you how disappointed I was that this board, after all the work that it has done, championed, championed this issue. And we had to take the blows that we took. Yes. I, when I got the report, I didn't stop and immediately say, I better check every number that this professional organization that we hired put in that report. I didn't do it. Eventually, I'm sure those errors would have come out. And I can honestly say that I don't think anybody on this board would have done what was done to us that night. I would like to believe that a member of this board would have called up the, a member of the other side and said, hey, there's some problems in this report and you need to look at them. But no, nope, that didn't happen. And so I believe that all the money we spent on those reports wasn't for nothing. I still think it was for something. Um, but I'm not sure that it really changed that much. The city has known for a long time that we expected them to pay for most of the senior center. We just don't generate enough revenue in order to do a project of that size. We were trying to do something for the citizens of this district. We don't look at it like, oh, it's your money and our money. I've said this before. I've said it so many times. Um, that's my tax money in their coffers. I pay it. I pay tons. And everybody on this board pays also. We, we weren't going to get anything out of it. No money was going in our pockets. We were just trying to make sure that the citizens of the district had what they needed. Many of us uh, have a lot of years on us. We don't know how long we're going to be here. And we wanted to accomplish this. And so I guess I'm more than disappointed. I'm pissed off at the way that that went down. I don't think it, it should have happened that way. And uh, so now they know it and everybody else does too. That's all I have. Anybody else? This meeting is adjourned.